An important part of how the Bureau helps consumer finance markets work is to hear directly from consumers, from industry, from our state and local partners, and from community advocates across the U.S. One of the ways that the Bureau gathers public feedback is through events such as these. We have held field hearings, town halls, and other events across the U.S. from Miami, Florida, to Itabina, Mississippi, to Seattle, Washington, and of course, Kansas City, Missouri. At these events, we not only hear from experts in the field, we also invite the public to participate. Before I open the floor for public comments, I want to remind folks that there are several other ways to communicate your observations, your views and concerns, or complaints to the CFPB. You can submit a consumer complaint with the CFPB through our website at consumerfinance.gov. Our website will walk you through that process. Or you can call 1-855-411-2372. The CFPB takes complaints about mortgages, car loans or leases, payday loans, student loans or other consumer loans. We also take complaints about credit cards, prepaid cards, credit reporting, debt collection, money transfers, bank accounts and services, and other financial services. If you don't have a specific complaint but would like to share your story with us, we have a feature on our website called Tell Your Story, where you can tell us your story, good or bad, about your experience with consumer financial products or services. Your story will help inform the work that we do to protect consumers and create a fairer marketplace. We have another feature called Ask CFPB, where you can find answers to over a thousand frequently asked questions about consumer financial issues, as well as additional resources. We also have a Spanish language website called CFPB en Español, which provides additional consumer resources. I encourage you to visit consumerfinance.gov to learn more about the resources and tools that the Bureau has developed to help consumers make the best decisions for themselves and for their family. Now it's time to hear from members of the public that are here today. A number of you have signed up to share comments and observations about today's discussion. The public comment portion of the field hearing is also an important opportunity for the CFPB to hear and learn about what's happening in consumer finance markets in your community. Each person who signed up to provide testimony will have one minute to do so. And what we hear from you is invaluable. In order to hear from as many of you as possible, I encourage you to please observe the one minute limit. If I call your name because you've indicated that you would like to provide testimony, but you have left the music hall I will call your name again, so please don't fret. If you have to leave for a few minutes, we will call on you again one more time. I will call five public commenters at a time. When I do, please make your way to the aisle to the closest CFPB staff with a microphone. Then I will call you again so that you may provide your testimony. Will the CFPB staff with microphones please raise their hands? Great. Public comment will be open for the next four hours to ensure that plenty of you have the opportunity to provide testimony. So let's get started. Our first group of commenters, Tishara Jones, City of St. Louis Treasurer, Paul Kurtman, State Representative, Ken Williams, Catholic Charities, Barbara Inman, Melinda Robinson, Let's start with Tashara Jones. Good afternoon. I'm Tashara Jones, treasurer of the city of St. Louis. And in August 2015, we opened the Office of Financial Empowerment in City Hall to help people make better decisions with their money. And since then, we've educated over 1,200 citizens and put them on the path to financial empowerment. My most important reason for speaking up today is because I'm a single working mother. The average borrower is a woman like me. 
I sometimes had to put everyday expenses or unexpected expenses on a credit card because my money ran out at the end of the month or I didn't have enough save for emergencies. Life happens, but we shouldn't be punished for life for it. One St. Louis area borrower, Naya Burks, saw her $1,000 loan, unaffordable from the start, turn into a $40,000 debt as her lender applied penalty fees and, un, and un, excuse me, ultimately attempted to sue. Predatory lenders only open in neighborhoods that have credit scores of 500 or less, prey on poor and minority populations, and keep people in poverty. As my good friend John Hope Bryan often says, nothing changes your life more than the love of God or a 120-point increase in your credit score. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Thank you. Paul Kurtman. Thank you. There's just a, a few things that I'd like to say. I've, I've had an opportunity, I've had to, to use these types of loans in the past. Sometimes these loans is all that stood between me and, and paying a bill or visiting my family. Uh, however, I do want to mention my concern about hundreds if not thousands of pages worth of bureaucratic rules being written that is directly going to affect the pros and cons of this market. Um, and when a bureaucracy can write, adjudicate, and execute the law, you've essentially robbed the people of the representative government. In addition to that, These particular laws, you mentioned that there's a test that has to be applied by the lender to see whether or not the lendee can pay it back. But what you haven't done, from what I understand, is you haven't actually considered whether or not the lendee will pay it back. So although you can manage the debt, although you can manage, although you can, can, can write rules for the lender, if the lendee decides instead of being financially responsible with his next paycheck, he's instead going to go take his friends to a concert and a round of drinks, how do you fix that problem? I'm afraid. I'm afraid that what's going to happen is I'm afraid that what's going to happen is as, as payday loan companies have to close their doors to people that really need the money, people are going to look for a, uh, um, other means of acquiring this capital. Means that thank are unregulated. you, Mr. Kurtman. Thank you, Ken Williams. Hi, I'm Ken Williams, CEO of Catholic Charities here in Northeast Kansas. A little over six months ago, uh, we teamed up with the Country Club Bank here in Kansas City to launch the Kansas Loan Pool Project to combat predatory lending in our area. What we do is we take those who are participating in the program and pay off their existing payday loan and convert them to 6% loans. We only have a few requirements. Number one, that they work with our case managers on a monthly basis to go over a budget, which we have no problem creating with them in that first meeting, uh, no problem whatsoever in determining whether or not they can actually pay the loan back. And, and so at the end of the day, why are we in the payday lending industry, if you will? Why are we making loans? We're a charity, we're a ministry to help people and drive them from, from crisis management to self-sufficiency. We're doing so because the payday loan industry has, has, has obstructed our, our, our efforts um, most of the people that we serve have payday loans. Their inabil inability to pay them off is obstructing the path to, to self-sufficiency. So thank we you, Mr. Williams. Barbara Inman. My name is Barbara Inman, and I'm the president and CEO of Habitat for Humanity of Florida. And I represent the 59 local Habitat for Humanity affiliates in the Sunshine State. We build more Habitat homes than any other state in the country, and we deliver $300 million in economic impact and serve 1,000 families a year. I am here because, simply put, the laws in the state of Florida do not protect Florida citizens from the payday loan debt trap. Uh, more than, I, I offer as proof that more than 80% of the payday loan fees collected in the state of Florida are uh, collected from families who have stacked more than seven loans in a year, of payday, uh, payday loans in a year. And the APR, average APR is 278%. The result of this is that these families can no longer afford a traditional bank mortgage, and so Habitat for Humanity may be the only outlet for them. We are already serving. Thank you, serving. Ms. Inman. Thank you. Our next five include Reverend Phil Snyder, Adam Rust, C. 
Sarah Cook, Reverend Sonika Hamlin, and Terrace Wise. Melinda Robinson. Reverend Phil Snyder. Adam Rust. Sarah Cook. Hi, um, my name is Sarah Cook. Um, I'm, I guess I wouldn't consider myself an average American. I'm a college educated woman. Um, I got into this trap because I've made some bad choices in my life and in my effort to rebuild it. I have that job and I should have been able to pay it back. And then there were some earthquakes and we weren't able to work. And so I had to roll it over. And then I had to roll it over again. And that's not something that I would normally have to do. And so by the grace of God, I was able to go to Catholic Charities. And I'm a member of that program. And they're helping me put everything back together. But if they hadn't been available, I'd have lost my checking account, my car, my home, everything. Because of something I had no control over. I didn't ask there to be earthquakes in China. So. Thank you, Ms. Cook. Reverend Sonika Hamlin. Director, Reverend Sakina Hamlin, Director of the Ecumenical Poverty Initiative. Based in Washington, D.C., we do the work that the National Council of Churches uh, continues to do around poverty. We are calling on the payday rule to close all loopholes, to make sure there is an ability to repay requirement to every loan, increase pro, uh, protections against loan flipping, and is broad enough to cover any loan that enables lenders to coerce repayment from borrowers. We recognize that America is a nation of strivers, people striving just to make ends meet. We recognize that because that is the story from those that are in our pews every Sunday. And we also recognize that the Bible says that you are not to exploit the poor just because they are poor. And so therefore, we stand to open our mouths and judge righteously and plead the cause of the Americans that are striving to make ends meet. Families deserve lending products that give them opportunities, not put them in oppression. It has to get better. Thank you, Reverend Hamlin. The next group of five commenters includes Hank Klein, Bill Francis, Cordy Marzenberg, Reverend Wallace, Wallace Sr., and Reverend Wallace II. Terrace Weiss, Hank Klein, Bill Francis, Cordy Marsenberg, My name is Bill Francis. I'm the director of the Diocese and Human Rights and Respect Life Office here in Kansas City, St. Joe, Missouri. I'd like to thank uh, Director Cordry for this opportunity. I want to echo something that Catholic Charities said in our counterpart diocese. We have a lot of, of Catholic social services organizations who are, are seeing more and more people who are suffering under the increasing burden of this debt. But one thing that was mentioned with the panel that I don't want to overlook is a lot of the money that's being paid and assistance that's being provided is to people who have money to pay their rent, to pay their utilities, to pay their lights, except for the fact that most of their money is going to these payday lenders. So those of us who choose to give our time, talent, and treasure to our Catholic service organizations to try to help out, we're actually complicit in this. We're actually paying to help support some of these predatory lenders. My role, I, I interact with a lot of different agencies, a lot of different organizations, but what struck me during this panel discussion is the narrative is all the same. It doesn't matter if it's immigration, prison ministry, payday lending, abortion, stem cell research, euthanasia, the narrative is all the same. People have to be responsible for the work that they're doing, and if they're not gonna take responsibility, the comment about, hey, you can't do this to us because you're gonna put us out of business. Well, isn't that what we're talking about? You can't do that to us because you're going to put us out of our livelihood. Thank you, Mr. Francis. Thank you. Thank you. Cordy Marsenberg. 
Yes, I am Cordy Marsenberg. I am a master's level social worker and I am also a community health worker. Yes, sir, what you're doing is good, um, but that is called codependency. Even though what is happening is for the good, it is codependency and it is supporting the, the payday loan industry. What I would like to say is um, I had to take early retirement to, and I got caught up in payday loans. I would like to say thank you. I had a chance to go to Jackson Hole, Wyoming and speak to the uh, Federal Reserves and I had a chance to speak with uh, the uh, chief financial, President Obama's fame financial, fame, uh, chief financial man. And I asked him, Who's here, who hears us? Um, and I'm grateful that you're here. Your research is accurate. Please do not deter from it. Deter from it. Um, I have an ask. Please look at locations. Location, location, location. I have passed universities here lately, and payday loans are right in front of the universities. Students have a hard enough time with payday lo with uh, student loans. Why? tax these kids with more financial problems and stress. And I would also ask, since the Affordable Care Act is um, fining hospitals now for return visits. Thank you, Ms. Marsenberg. Oh, please, find them if, if on defaults. Find those folks on defaults. Thank you for being here today. Reverend Wallace Sr., Reverend Wallace II. The next group of five includes Eva Kreidit, Schultz, Claudia Nelson, Reverend Brandon Mims, Carrie Hollis, and Shalon Collier. Eva Schultz. Claudia Nelson. Uh, I'm Eva Schulte. I'm the director of Communities Creating Opportunity. For 15 years, we have confronted payday lending. We have seen how usury rates in Missouri protected families in the 90s at 28% APR and when overturned, now the profiteering that's happening within our region is spiraling them into debt. Ms. Marsenberg, having double master's degrees, should not have to take out a payday loan that is designed to keep her in a cycle where she is unable to pay. If you don't have the money today, you don't have it in two weeks. We encourage the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to make longer repayment. We encourage the CFPD to make sure that uh, the products that we have do not go above 36% APR, and we encourage the CFPB to make sure that usury doesn't happen in our region. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schulte. <laughs> Claudia Nelson. Good morning. I'm Claudia Nelson. I um, am and a part of CCO as well, and um, I stand to say that I live in a community um, where I built my home. I've never had a payday loan, thank God. Uh, but I have family members who have, and in, our, in my neighborhood, there are at least five within walking distance of my house. Five. All booming, doing great business. If um, one of the panelists stated that they're going to go out of business, I highly doubt that. The system of paying people less than a livable wage who have families to feed is going to keep payday loans in business. They're not going out of business. They also don't have to extort from people an, uh, the amount of triple digit interest rates so that we don't, people don't have an option. A statement was also said that people have an option. There is no option for someone who has to decide whether to feed their family, to pay their rent, get their car fixed. And there's someone on the corner saying, yes, give us your banking account, we'll give you $300. Uh, people are desperate. People are desperate. People have lost their homes, lost their jobs, lost their Thank you, Ms. Nelson. Thank you. Reverend Brandon Mims. Carrie Hollis. Oh. 
Hi, I'm Carrie Hollis, and I would just like to say that in the brief review that I've had the rule, it almost seems socialistic. It assumes that the government has a better insight for consumers that obtain $300 to $500 loans than the consumers themselves. If anyone has an opportunity to obtain a cheaper loan, surely they would take it. If this rule is implemented, what will be the impact on the local economies and of the consumers that do not pay back the loans? Will there be a study of these aspects of the rule? All of these consumers will still need credit. This rule seems to exceed the Bureau's authority, and as proposed, it's overbroad and hurts the very people it is trying to help. Consumers still need more credit options, not less, and this seems to be exactly what the rule is, go is going to accomplish. Thank you, Ms. Hollis. The next group of five includes Alicia Brown, Winifred Jamison, Steve Reuter, Dave Berenger, and Brittany Hill. Shalan Collier. My name's Shalan Collier, actually. <laughs> Um, I was recently featured in uh, an op-ed in the Kansas City Star as a previous customer. I don't know all the details of the proposal, but I do appreciate the effort of everyone here today. Thank you, Ms. Collier. <laughs> Alicia Brown. I work for a family-owned payday lending company. Uh, I'm going to absolutely disagree with stores closing because I've already seen it um, within my company. I've already seen it within the state licensings. Um, when you go onto their website and look, I'm the compliance officer for my company. So it is my job to work with state regulators and to make sure that our company follows the letter of the law. There are states that may need a little bit more stricter regulations. But the laws that you put out, these proposed rules, are going to shut down the little guys. I mean, there is no way you can do a one-size-fits-all for all of us. I think we need to focus on illegal lending or with those states that do have, you know, these horror stories of customers that have been mistreated. I'm not going to lie. There are some. But there are so much good that we have done where we do not want to abuse customers or to harm customers or have them file bankruptcy. See, we are good people. There is a need for us. We cannot go away. The, right now, my contracts are three pages long, full of information our customers need to need in, in nice large print. It's not little small print. We Thank you, Ms. Brown. <laughs> Winifred Jameson. Steve Reuter. Hello, my name is Steve Reuter. I'm uh, owner of American Credit Services, a single store located in St. Louis. I started in the finance business in the mid-90s when I noticed a need for someone to borrow $300 to $500 based on an income of $1,500 to $2,000 a month. The new rules would limit me to make that customer a $75 loan. That would not fit the customer's needs. I will be priced out of business as customers will have no other options to get the money they need. When processing our loan applications, we currently turn out 50% of applications due to credit worthiness and lack of income. Once these rules are adopted, I would lose everything. My employees would lose their jobs and insurance. I had to take out a loan to build my business. I will be defaulted on my loan. My landlord would lose his lease. Vendors would lose their income. The state would lose my taxes and licensing fees. The losses will go on and on and have a huge impact on the borrowers and our economy. My business is regulated by the state and I'm audited every year to make sure I'm in compliance by the law. I've never been cited by the state, never had a complaint on my business. If my customers fall in a situation and they cannot pay their loan, I offer them a payment plan that to help them pay off their loan. If you put me out of business, my customers are gonna go elsewhere, like the offshore operator that charges a much higher APR, or the black market, which will cause corruption and more crime in our city. Thank you, Mr. Reuter. Dave Berenger. Hi, I'm David Berenger, National CEO of the Society of St. Vincent de Paul, Catholic network of volunteers in 4,400 U.S. communities. Last year, the Society provided nearly a billion dollars in cash and in-kind services to over 14 million people in need. On behalf of the Society, I thank the Bureau for the opportunity to testify. In our 600,000 home visits annually with people in need, it's been sentenced here all too often about the financial and emotional 
damage caused by predatory loans. This is why we support strong regulation. Two-week loans often get rolled over and are still liabilities months later, leading to stress and shame as meals are skipped or medical appointments are canceled. Predatory loans also divert valuable and limited community resources away from meeting human needs. Instead of buying clothes or food or helping to make a rent payment, nonprofits' financial resources go to lenders to pay off high-interest debt. Too many people struggle to make ends meet and frequently need help. This calls for compassion, not exploitation. The Society thanks the Bureau in its efforts to rein in abuses of predatory lending. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berenger. The next group includes Kayla Baylock, Courtney Reeder, Wendy Hurst, Nick Bork. Brittany Hill. Kayla Baylock. Courtney Reeder, um, hi, I'm Courtney and I work for Check Into Cash and I just want to say that I was a customer years ago, I've been in the industry for like nine years and I had to do uh, loans a long time ago when I was 18 and they helped me and I got on my feet and then I became an employee. I love what I do, I help people. Um, my customers love me, they come in to my store, they know what they're coming in for and I go over everything that's in black and white and they sign it, they agree to it and they come back and they see me and we talk about everything that needs to be talked about. And that's it. Thank you, Ms. Reeder. Wendy Hurst. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Wendy Hurst. I am a district manager for Check Into Cash. I spent 15 years of my life working for non-for-profits. Some of those non-for-profits in this room. Everything I do today helps people. Not everything I did before helped the public. There are 1,200,000 of us across the nation. Who's going to take care of my family when I don't have a job? Are the charities going to step in and pay the electric bills that I can't pay? Are, the, are they going to step in and take care of my rent or pay education for my children? They're not for yours either. I am a responsible lender, and I take care of our employees, I take care of our customers, and I ask people not to come back. Thank you, Ms. There Hurst. Nick Bork. Thank you. I'm Nick Bork, the director of the Small Dollar Loans Project at the Pew Charitable Trust. We are a public policy research organization. Uh, the Bureau cited a lot of our research in its rule. There's a lot of harm in the payday loan market, and er, uh, reform is urgently needed. This rule has flaws, however, but it can still be fixed. To my friends in the consumer advocacy community, this rule leaves too many people at risk. It leaves too many 400% APR loans on the market. It gives payday lenders too much power to dictate whatever terms they want as long as they collect the right data file the right paperwork, and remain powerful enough to take money directly from the borrower's checking accounts. And to those at banks and credit unions, this rule blocks you out of this market. It stops you from making lower costs available. Will payday lenders will, conduct, will complete endless paperwork to make a $400 loan and they'll take on regulatory risk? You will not. You need clearly defined rules which are lacking. There are a lot of borrowers here. We've talked to hundreds around the country. They've told us that they sometimes turn to small credit to get help paying bills. They're desperate for affordable payments, lower cost, and fair terms. We urge the CFPB to help borrowers get what they want. We Thank urge you, the Mr. CFPB Bork. to fix this rule by putting clear product safety standards in. Thank you. The next group includes Martha Huffman, Carmelita Clark, Margita Taylor, Julie Riddle and Amanda Brewer. I see a young lady standing by Ed. 
afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Kayla Blaylock. I'm a regional director with Advance America. Um, I've recently, wrote, <laughs> recently relocated my entire family to Kansas. Um, you know, eliminating cash advances does not erase the consumer's need uh, for short-term credit or ease the challenges that they face. These are, these are real challenges that our customers are facing. Um, c consumers choose cash advances because they are reliable and transparent, and they do help them in their time of need. You know, we, we're very proud to say we have a 97% uh, customer satisfaction um, rate, where when the customers come in, they rate their experience as, you know, 97% of them are, um, have a great experience with us. Consumers benefit from more choices, not fewer. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hill. Martha Huffman. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Martha Huffman, and um, I'm a retired teacher, but my experience comes from my neighbor. Um, she is a young mother with five ch four children at home, and she fell behind on her utility, so she took out a, a title loan. Um, she took out an $800 title loan, and uh, she's had so much trouble paying it back that not only is her electricity off, she's also lost her car. She has come around the neighborhood asking people for food because she has not enough money to buy groceries. While I understand the need for the payday lending industry to make a living, it is not right to make a killing. When I look in the eyes of her children, I realize that what you're killing it's the future of the children in this country, and you've got to stop. And thank you for the, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Huffman. Carmelita Clark. Hi, I am Carmelita. I am not against payday loan companies. I am against the high interest rates being charged. Son, lost car, car title loan. Friend, homeless, living in her car three payday loans, they started garnishing her dis disability check. What can I do, Lord, I said. He said, as a songwriter, write a song, produce a music video, beware of payday loans, YouTube, hook. I know you got loans, we all do. Car notes, house notes, school loans too. But payday loan interest will rob you blind. It's the biggest hustle of all times. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Margita Taylor. I thank you. I'm Margita Taylor. And I really want to speak from, certainly to talk about the problems that my sister had. My sister took out um, payday loans. She's extremely educated, two master's degrees, wonderful, kind, caring, had an emergency, and was stuck in those payday loans. I would have to take her all over town to pay the interest on this one, to take care of this one, because the interest was astronomical. She no longer has payday loans because she's dead. Sorry to hear that, Ms. Taylor. Thank you for being here today. Julie Riddle. We represent whoa, uh, six counties in the Kansas City metro area, and we want to uh, join our voices to the chorus of people calling for common sense regulation of small dollar and short term lenders. Um, specifically, we're looking for longer repayment terms. Um, it's Limits, <laughs> limits on harmful collection practices and ensuring people are able to repay the loans. We're also disputing the term short term for many families because they have to renew the loans, roll over the loans, refinance the loans multiple times. We really support market-based interventions, um, but we want the market to do better. We need the market to support the long-term financial of families throughout our community and create bridges and 
Thank you, Ms. Riddle, and thank you for bearing with the microphone. We'll see if we can get a better microphone in that area. The next group includes Amy Keaton, Bridget Hughes, Amelia Reyes, Ryan Miller, and Leisha Manning. Amanda Brewer is next. Um, I'm standing in for Amanda Brewer. My name is Sean Alahi, and I am General Counsel for Habitat for Humanity of Omaha, Nebraska. Like many other Habitat volunteers and staff throughout the country, I'm here today to urge for a strong CFPB rule to stop the harmful cycle of payday loans. In Nebraska, payday lenders charge as high as 460% annual interest rates. Payday lending and payday type loans are a trap that takes advantage of weak and desperate moments and extorts money over time. Habitat for Humanity works to reduce the cost of housing to families and advocates for affordable renting units. We want to support individuals that thrive with strength, stability, and independence. Habitat for Humanity is a proud partner of Nebraska Appleseed in its work to promote consumer protection against the abuses of payday lending. Clear guidelines and standards cannot be undervalued. And we appreciate CFPB's courage and leadership on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sean. Amy Keaton. My name is Amy Jude Keaton. I am reasonably intelligent. I am college educated. I have a master's degree in English from Kansas State University. 10 years ago, I left my career of 10 years teaching university classes to take care of my mother. When she passed away in 2011, I began to struggle because I lost my home. I could no longer afford the rent that she had been paying and I could not find a job teaching in the Kansas City area. I took out a payday loan um, last year because I had been struggling desperately to meet my needs, my basic needs, my rent, my electricity, my water, my trash, and my garbage. I thought with my income from my retail that I do that I would be able to pay it back and that everything would be okay within a month. And you get into that mindset when you are struggling that tomorrow will take care of tomorrow. So I took out the loan, even though I knew it wasn't a very good idea. I got into the point where they were expecting me to give them $297 in cash every two weeks, and they would give me back $250 to struggle to pay my bills. I was paying almost $100 a month just to take my own paycheck home. I could no longer stand it. And I do want to just add to this, Catholic Charities and the Kansas Loan Program did pay off all of my loans. I have a loan with Country Club Bank that cost me $62 a month, and that full in September. Thank you, Ms. Keaton. Bridget Hughes, Amelia Reyes. Hi, my name is Amelia Reyes, and I'm with Catholic Charities of Northeast Kansas. I run our Kansas Loan Pool Project. Um, and the real issue for us that we saw is that the community was really being damaged and not able to meet the needs that they had because they get so far behind in these loans that they are literally paying interest and nothing to principal. That's not acceptable. We need to find a way to adjust what's going on with the payday lending industry so that the product allows them to pay off. People do get in desperate situations and they need options, but those options can't put them in a place where they will never get out from under it. We see a lot of people with fixed income who come in and their fixed income is never going to adjust. They are the ones who suffer the most because they have no way of ever getting out from under things. So we need p regulators to help us to make sure that pe people are not being taken advantage of when they are most vulnerable. Thank you, Ms. Reyes. Ryan Miller. My name is Ryan Miller and I'm Executive Director of Habitat for Humanity of Ohio. I represent the interest of 51 Habitat affiliates, Buckeye State. Habitat for Humanity serves low-income families at 30 to 80 percent of the area median income. This income group is the same population community inundated with vehicle title lenders. At Habitat for Humanity, we're not just builders, but also lenders. We offer affordable mortgages to Habitat homeowners who go through a rigorous qualification process. We prepare our home buyers for success by verifying their ability to repay the loan. We have seen the negative effects of payday lending on applicants for Habitat homeownership. 
Payday and car title lenders began exploiting loopholes in Ohio's law shortly after millions of Ohio voters overwhelmingly affirmed capping interest rates at 28%. We respectfully request CFPB to issue a strong rule without loopholes to stop the payday lending debt trap. We appreciate the leadership of Director Cordray and the CFPB on this very important issue to hardworking families. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. The next group includes Hank Klein, Maddie Oakman, Reverend Tobias Schulenspian. I'm sure I mangled that. Apologies in advance. Reverend Susan McCang, Reverend Lloyd Fields, and Reverend Stevie Wakes. Lisa Manning. Hank Klein. Yeah, I'm Hank Klein, founder of Arkansans Against Abusive Payday Lending, and I'm going to talk about something no one else has talked about here. What happens when the payday lenders leave? In Arkansas, we had payday loans for 10 years, from 1999 to 2009, even though the interest rate charged exceeded our 17% constitutional usury limit many times over. It took 10 years and hard work to overcome the payday lenders with three Arkansas Supreme Court opinions in 2008. A year later, the last payday lender left our state, and we've been payday loan free for the last seven years. How are people doing in Arkansas? Much better than before. A recent, a recent survey conducted seven years after the payday lenders left found in our state found that significant majority of former borrowers said their financial life was better off when there was no payday lenders enticing them by offering quick cash at high cost payday loans. Though payday loans may seem like a lifeline during times of financial strife, they're actually an anchor that causes the borrower to sink deeper and deeper in a sea of debt that's hard to get out of. Thank you, Please Mr. Please issue Klein. a strong rule so that the nation can get out of payday loans everywhere. Okay. Maddie Oakman. And I, I need to thank Catholic Charities for the work. I am a volunteer. I am also a college graduate. But the reason I went and got the payday loan is after my 42 years in banking, as an African American, the first one ever hired to sit in the front row of National Bank of Commerce, no one would give me a loan, even though they had 200, over $240,000 of our family money, I could not borrow 1000 That's the reason for the payday loan, and I do thank the payday loan. And the reason I borrowed is my son's medication costs $1,300, and they says, oh, we can't help you because you're Oprah Winfrey's family, and y'all got too much money in y'all's bank account. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Oakman. Reverend Tobias Schillingespin. Reverend Susan McCann. Reverend Lloyd Fields. Reverend Stevie Wakes. The next group incur in includes Merle Zerke, Seth Hunter, Reverend Edmondson, Elliot Clark, and Larry Ginter. Merle Zerke. Go ahead. Hello. I'm Reverend W.T. Edmondson from Jefferson City, Missouri. We have uh, started trying to deal with payday lending for a number of years. We were collecting petitions Petitions were stolen in Springfield, Missouri. We have found and we have had individuals to come and testify before us. And there are many problems. You've heard all the problems. The fact of the matter is, no one wished to pay, put the payday lenders out of business. We simply want them to do fair business. And fair business, if it's good enough, 36% is good enough for the military, it's good enough for the rest of the country. Thank you, Reverend Edmondson. 
Seth Hunter, Elliot Clark, Larry Ginter. The next group includes Reshan Moore, Scott Morris, Ashley Tisby, Jennifer Krim, and Tim Thomas. Let's start with Reshan Moore. Hi, my name is Reshan Moore. This rule is going to have a devastating impact on the industry. This far exceeds the Bureau's authority. 70% of the lending industry will go away, particularly those small businesses that serve rural areas. This is not helping the consumer. If you think the banks and credit unions will fill this space, you just don't know the consumer very well. Banks and credit unions could have serviced this void long ago if they wanted to. They made a conscious and logical choice not to serve these consumers, as we've heard earlier today. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Scott Morris. From what I can see, there's no credible evidence to back up what this rule was outlining for a $300 to an $800 loan. It's totally unreasonable and ridiculous. I would have to ask, how many focus groups have you had with customers to run this rule by them? Or how many stores have you visited and talked with the actual consumers? It appears that this rule has been made up in a vacuum and that there is no real world evidence to back up the need for such a draconian rule that will hurt the very people that the rule is supposed to help. From my years of serving customers and reading through this rule, it appears to me to be unproven, unsupported, and illogical, and it's totally incorrect assumptions. One would think it is just based on preconceived notions after reading through it once. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Ashley Tisby. Hello, my name is Ashley Tisby, and I want to start off by saying what I've said to so many of my customers. Yes, this loan can become expensive if you don't utilize the options that are available to you, and I advise against it if you feel as if this may be too expensive for you. If you feel like you cannot pay this back within one or two payments, I'd advise you to go ask a friend or family member to, to loan you the money to take out this loan. What's being missed here is when these rules and regulations are passed, the employees are at risk. We lose our jobs. I was a part of a layoff because of rules and regulations. I lost my place to live. I lived in my car too. Not because of a payday loan, but because of rules and regulations that were passed. I was homeless because of the consumers not wanting to pay attention to us when we're explaining to them how this loan works or not wanting to ask questions when they take out this loan. I think it's just as much as the responsibility of a lender to provide this information to the consumers as it is to the consumers to pay attention to the rules and regulations that are being in place by the lender. Thank you, Ms. Tisby. <laughs> Jennifer Prim. I was a loan officer for several years for a large financial institution. I had to turn away numerous people every day because people who needed a small short-term loan didn't meet our underwriting guidelines. The company I work now helps where they don't. I had a mother whose son was in a horrible car accident and he was in critical condition. Because of my organization, she was able to get to her son before he passed. We helped her when no one else could. We offer solutions when there are no other options. There are many, many stories like this, and all of our customers are educated about the written terms and conditions of the agreements that we provide. If the loan is treated responsibly, people will not fall into the overused term today that has been called the debt trap. Thank you, Ms. Prim. The next group includes Jamika Cox, Miguel Rodriguez, Amy Jude Keaton, Jim Davis, and Dorothy Kaiser. Tim Thomas. Jamika Cox.
Miguel Rodriguez. Is that Ms. Cox? Hi, my name is Jamika Cox and I work for Centronex and I've been in the payday loan industry for about 11 years. And I just wanna say I'm here to support not only the customers, but as well as the employees. We have families too, and we're trying to make it just as much as they are. We are always giving them the terms and the understanding of what these terms will help them through in the future so we can get them out of debt. Excuse me, I'm very nervous. But I could not sit there and not say anything knowing that I have three children at home that look towards me to be supportive to them. So without me having a job, this affects my children as well as my coworkers as families. And it's really sad that we have to stand here today and explain ourselves when we've explained it to them several times and ask them, do you understand this? If you do not understand this, please ask questions. Thank you, Ms. Thank Cox. You. Miguel Rodriguez. Amy Jude Keaton. Jim Davis. Hi, uh, I'm Jim Davis, and I'm here as a former member of the Missouri Civil, Civil Haired Legislature which is an advocate group for seniors. Uh, we would meet once a year and we would devise uh, what we felt were the top priorities for seniors and we'd present that to the state legislature. Uh, the whole time I was involved and well before that, uh, payday loan reform was at the, one of the top issues that we submitted and we never got any, any support from it. We couldn't get any action taken. And I can say with a high level of confidence that the Missouri legislature will never solve the payday loan problem in Missouri. I'm also, uh, I also coordinate finance, financial ministries for my congregation. And I've done this for about 10 years. And it's a sad story, but most of the people I try to help, no kind of a loan would help them. That's just gonna push them farther and farther into debt. Uh, I think there's a place for payday loans, but I think it's highly abused. Uh, and I have a question for the Bureau, actually. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Davis. Okay, thanks. The next group includes Elizabeth Glenn, Larry Ginter, Steve Glorioso, Bishop James Tyndall, and John Weston. And I'll call for Dorothy Kaiser. Elizabeth Glenn, Larry Ginter, Steve Glorioso, Bishop James Tyndall, the next group includes John Weston, Barry Brandon, Ginny Robnett, Stephen Reeves, Reverend George Paulwood, and Garland Land. John Weston. My name is John Weston. Um, I had uh, some comments that I wanted to say regarding what I thought was a, a little onerous of a over 1,300 page document for a $350 loan. But as I sat here and listened, um, there was a couple things that I wanted to notice. When Ms. Martinez started the entire discussion today, she said that the goal of the CFPB and their mission is to empower the consumer. I'm not sure how taking things away from a consumer actually helps empower them. Um, where does that leave their free choice? And I've heard over and over discussions of personal responsibility. The consumer needs to have personal responsibility. They're empowered to do that. <laughs> Director Cordray said in his comments that we want to restore a larger measure of control over their own financial condition for the consumer. Again, by taking things away, how do we provide an additional 
control over their own financial condition. I just don't see it. So those Thank are my you, questions. Mr. Weston. Thank you. Barry Brandon. Yeah. Hello, my name is Barry Brandon. I'm the executive director of the Native American Financial Services Association, uh, or NAFSA, as it's called. Uh, NAFSA represents over 20 federally recognized Indian tribes that are currently involved in the short-term online lending space. Uh, they do so pursuant to tribal law, uh, laws that are enacted by the, by the tribe and, and authorized to, to run these types of businesses. They also follow federal law. They also follow a model lending code as established by NAFSA. Uh, they also follow best practices. Um, Interestingly, as was described about uh, uh, credit unions, uh, tribes who operate these businesses also operate nonprofit businesses. 100% of the proceeds of these businesses go back to fund basic services for the poorest people in this country. Uh, the tribes that we work with are dedicated to regulation. They've established regulatory regimes that oversee and operate these facilities. Um, I think few would argue with the fact that uh, Native Americans in this country understand what it is to be discriminated against, to be oppressed, and to be put down, and therefore our tribal leaders bring that same mindset as they do business over the internet to service uh, those who need these types of products. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Brandon. Ginny Robnett. Hi. My name is Ginny Robnett and I coordinate the Stop the Debt Trap campaign. Um, we're a campaign of over 500 civil rights, labor, faith, consumer, um, and community organizations across the country in all 50 states. And uh, first we wanted to thank the CFPB uh, for this action, this rule has the potential to finally stop predatory practices that um, trap our communities and our families in a cycle of debt. On behalf of one of our partners, uh, I'm delivering today 50,000 petition signatures urging the CFPB <laughs> to put forth a strong final rule that will finally stop the debt trap. And over the next 90 days, our partners and communities will continue to work to provide comments to the CFPB in support of the strongest possible rule. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robnett. Chrissy, will you uh, receive the petitions? Thank you. Stephen Reeves. Reverend George Paulwood. Garland Land. I come as a volunteer from Independence, Missouri. I volunteer at the Holy Rosary Credit Union. In the past two years, the credit union has made loans to low-income people with an average credit score of 575. The default rate has been 5%. The loan industry in Missouri claims that their default rate is about 33%. There's two reasons why the credit union has a much lower default rate. First, the credit union charges 5 to 20% interest rate as compared to 4 and 55% interest rate of the payday loan industry. Secondly, the credit union determines the, ability, the applicant's ability to repay a loan. The small loan industry does not determine a loan's applicant's ability to repay the loan, even though Missouri law requires it. I hope the CFB will keep the requirement to determine an applicant has the ability to repay a loan there should be no exceptions to that. I also volunteer weekly at one of the largest food, food pantries in the Kansas City area. About 20% of our people come to the pantry, pantry have a payday loan. I often ask them, what has been your experience? I've never had a single person say they were certainly glad that they could get a payday loan. In fact, many of them say that was the worst decision I've ever made in my life. Thank you, Mr. Land. The next group includes Andrew Zalay, Jennifer Trogdon, Tamalu Brothers, Jennifer Sims, and Robin Moore. We'll start with Andrew Zalay. Jennifer Trogdon. 
Tamalu Brothers, Jennifer Sims, Robin Moore. Hello, my name is Robin, and I just want to say that I was a customer before I was an employee. I work for Vance America, and I keep hearing that um, payday lenders are being perceived as predatory, but I don't recall them coming to my door forcing me to get a loan. It was my choice. I walked, I went to them to get the loan. I understood the terms. I understood the amount I was taking out. I agreed to it. I signed the paper. That was my responsibility to pay back the loan. Like I said, my choice to go there, my responsibility to take out the loan. After I paid it back, I chose to work for Advance America because I believe in what the company does and helps people, and I want to be one of those people that helps the community and the people out there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore. The next group includes Brandy Trainer, Jared Martin, Pat Turner, Paul Kurtman, Brandy Trainer, Jared Martin. Hey, um, my name's Jared. Um, I want to discuss the rule for $300 to $500 uh, loans. Um, in my opinion, uh, it's completely arbitrary and seems to be totally unreasonable. Um, when you look at the cooling off period, mentioned in the new rule, um, combine that with percentage of income to uh, underwrite the loan. Uh, in my experience with this industry, um, it's absolutely arbitrary, um, lacks any evidence that it can be uh, backed up, and I think it's pretty dangerous to try and unroll, un, un, uh, unravel something that would really hurt consumers by restricting uh, access. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Pat Turner. Hi, my name is Pat Turner, and I'm the president and CEO of Truman Heritage Habitat here in Eastern Jackson County. And the effects of payday lending in our community and throughout the state are unmistakable. Habitat homeowner applicants, habitat homeowners, habitat friends and loved ones with low income and no savings reserves have been faced with cash crunches. Many of them have made a deal that was worse than the initial problem. The overwhelming stress of these loans has more than just the financial impact, the financial strain of trying to figure out how to get the money to pay off these loans impacts the borrower's health, physically, psychologically, and emotionally. If borrowers default, it damages whatever credit they have and limits the chances of obtaining a loan later, which in turn begets even more stress. We regulate mortgage debt, we regulate credit card debt, we regulate auto debt. We must regulate payday and payday type loans. Thank Truman, you, Ms. Turner. Thank you so much, CFPB. Ed? Go ahead. Hi, will you identify yourself? Brandy Trainer with Advance America. Over the past five years, I've been employed with Advance America. During that time, I've done many different things with the company. My most notable was probably working the counter as a center manager with my customers. Because Advance America and our lending product, I have been able to assist hundreds of customers that had no other place to go. Taking access away from our customers would prove de devastating to their livelihood and place undue hardship on the people that I call my friends. Thank you, Ms. Trainer. Paul Kurtman. The next group of five includes Nanette Phillips, William Mullins, Mike Nesbitt, Jackie Green, and Deanna Beasley. Good afternoon, my name is Chris Faith and I lead the CFPB's Office of Community Affairs 
It is a pleasure to be here with you in Kansas City. I am uh, giving my boss, Sixta Martinez, a little break. We will continue with the audience comments, starting with the group of five that she named. And uh, I will just say in advance that we appreciate the observation of the one minute limit to ensure that we hear from as many of you as possible. Let's please continue to observe that limit. And with that, we will start with Nanette Phillips. Hi, my name is Nanette Phillips. And I wasn't prepared to be able to speak before you, but I thank you for listening. Um, I had a payday loan several many years ago when I was new to the Kansas City area. And I do see it as predatory because they do come to, into your house. There's commercials, if you watch television, every other commercial is for a payday loan. And to me, that is predatory. I had a, it was a car issue that started it, and I took out two loans from two different companies, and I could not pay them back, so I had to get somebody else to pay that interest, so then I had three loans. And, and that went on every two weeks, just paying that $15 interest every two weeks. And that went on for six months. And by the grace of God, my husband was able to get a job that we were not living on minimum wage anymore. And that's how I, I got out of that trap. But I pity the poor people who can't get out of the trap because they don't have that extra lift to get a better job. Thank you, Ms. Phillips. William Mullins. Hello. This is all right now. It's working. Thank you. Um, I would like to draw attention to a couple of key points. One is it's unfortunate that I have to sit here and listen to employees working in this industry more or less being played off against the 10% of the people who use these services who. I think pretty clearly are not up to the challenges of making the kind of choices that they're being asked to make. And so there's, a, there's an equity issue there. The second thing I'd like to draw attention to is the one comment regarding the use of algorithms and statistics and profiling uh, by the industry. This is only going to become more and more prominent. And in the process, we're going to lose individuality. We're going to be locking in entire blocks and zip codes. Uh, and I hope that the uh, Bureau is looking forward to how these techniques are going to be used more and more aggressively in these loopholes. So a strong rule with few loopholes seems like a very good idea to me looking forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mullins. Mike Nisbet. Hi. I'm a regional director for Flexible Finance, a local small business operating here in Missouri. I've been in the industry for 13 years, and regulations are not a new thing to us. We have come to expect and accept change, and we welcome new healthy pr consumer protections. In Missouri, we have protections in place, including the 75% rate cap, renewal options requiring 5% mandatory principal reductions, and off-ramps, also extended payment plans. The current CFPB proposal, in my opinion, does not, <coughs> excuse me, does not offer additional healthy consumer protections. I strongly urge you to speak directly to our consumers. When I ask them how your proposal will affect them, they do not feel financially protected. Actually, quite the opposite. They feel exposed and abandoned, knowing that they will have nowhere to turn when they need a small dollar loan. With rising operating costs and strict limitations proposed on the use of our products, <clears throat> excuse me, the use of our products the small business I work for simply will not survive. In the absence of small businesses like mine, providing the necessary product, our customers will turn to the black market or unlicensed lenders, both the industry and most importantly, the consumer loses. I sincerely hope the CFPB will, <clears throat> excuse me, will be open to the public feedback on the, on the proposed rules and seriously consider alternatives bef before the final rules are adopted. If adopted as proposed, our industry will cease to exist. The consumers, the consumers that we serve will not have access to the credit that they need when they need it. Thank you, Mr. Nesbitt. Jackie Green. Hi, my name is... <laughs> Hi, my name is Jackie Green, and I work for Advance America, where I have been employed for more than eight years. 
And as has been said before earlier by several other speakers, this is not only affecting our consumers, this is affecting the employees. The faces of these companies are the ones that are going to be truly affected. Who's going to pay my house payment that I just bought? I'm a first time home buyer and now I'm threatened to not have my home. You're going to force me into bankruptcy before I'm 30. These are not things that are available for the consumers. Like we need to not regulate what they're having, like they're, what is available to them. What you're doing is making it even harder. It's harder on me and my two kids. If you, the, if you pass the rules that are proposed today, what about the Americans who have to work and pay their bills? What about my children and the, the daycare and the food? I am an employee for Advance America and I stand behind the product that is being regulated here today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. I will call up the next group of five, Reverend Wallace Hartfield, Justin Hampton, Nader Moss, Tonya Holmes, and Pastor Leroy Glover. Please make your way toward the aisle. Dina Beasley. Reverend Wallace Hartfield. Okay, we'll come back. Um, Natter Moss. Tonya Holmes. Good afternoon. My name is Tonya Holmes, and I'm a volunteer with AARP here in Kansas City, Missouri. People on fixed incomes find themselves in difficult situations of their income not stretching to the end of the month. Unexpected expenses like caring for a loved one, purchasing necessary health items, or fixing a car. These things can send older Americans looking for extra cash to get them through to the end of the month. The ease and availability of payday loans and other predatory lending practices here in Missouri has led many people on fixed incomes into a cyclical debt trap. When fees exceed interest rates of 400%, it becomes nearly impossible to make that next check extend through the next month and the cycle continues. People are vulnerable who have fixed income, limited credit history, or a bad credit history. The business model of a payday loan lender demands that their customers come back month after month as they once again find themselves in the same situation. This is a situation for which a payday loan is both the solution and the cause. I represent on behalf of over 760,000 AARP members in the state of Missouri, I urge you to institute common sense regulations on the payday lenders, or just better put, pull the plug on the entire predatory lending institutions. Thank you, Ms. Holmes. The next five will be Dale Irwin, Reverend C.L. Stansel, Rodney Bland, Jamaica Collins, and Eva Schultz. Now, Pastor Leroy Glover. First off, I'm glad to be named in the same uh, group with uh, Reverend Hartsfield, and he's standing over to my right. But I want to say this first off. I've been really listening. And one thing anybody can say about me, I have honesty and integrity. I'm the senior pastor of One Truth Ministries. I'm also the president of Foxtown East Neighborhood Association. And as everybody can see, I'm the best dressed in the room today. <laughs> but you know, as I've been listening, I try, to be, I try to listen to both sides. And I hope the people that were on the panel today are still here, because if you're not, that's evidence that you don't really con are really concerned about what we have to say. So I hope that you're still here if you're on the panel. But as I've been listening, I've also been listening to the employees of some of these predatory lenders. And I call them predatory lenders because they are. The reason I know is just as I know that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, I also know because I was hired as a collector at one of these places. While I was in training, I got fired on my fourth day because I kept ask asking them hard questions. The reason why, I wasn't down. They told me that their objective and their goal is to keep you in debt. They do not want you to pay off the loan. So listen, 
When it comes to all the employees, and I've noticed this too, all the employees that got up here and spoke, spoke about woe is me if I lose my job. What about those that have? There are drug addicts, there are alcoholics, there are gambling addicts, lots of people with addictions that have fallen into the trap of this. You guys are the predatory lending, not the employees, but the mamas and daddies of it. You need to change your addiction too and your mindset. Otherwise, you can't expect us to have sympathy for you if you don't have sympathy for those that have already hurt. Thank you, Pastor Glover. <laughs> Did I hear that Reverend Hartfield is here in the room? Hi, my name is Wallace Hartfield. I'm pastor of Metropolitan Baptist Church uh, with a regular membership of about 700. Uh, we have almost 10% of the people at our church that have been affected negatively by payday lending. And I would just encourage the CFPB to take note of the fact that our charity uh, efforts are not being able to keep up with the injustices that are being put forth uh, by payday lenders. I'm not going to paint with a big paintbrush because I can't speak for all of this nation, but I can say with the communities that I am involved with, payday lending has not contributed anything positive to our neighborhoods. <laughs> Yes, it has provided small dollar loans and so forth, but those loans have not built people. They have built profits and they have destroyed people. Finally, let me say, I keep hearing persons say, if payday lenders go away, how are we going to fill the void? I would say this to you. There's a great need in our neighborhoods for fathers in the home. But if I had to make a choice of putting an abusive father into a home, just so that I could have a father in the home. I would not do that. That is not a reason to keep payday lenders around. Thank you, Reverend Hartfield. Dale Irwin. What's your name? Justin Hampton. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Justin Hampton and I've actually worked for Quick Cash for the past 14 years. I haven't always lived in Kansas City. I'm from a small rural town in Missouri. You might have heard of it, Sedalia, the State Fair. Um, my, yeah, thank you. Uh, I am not a pastor, uh, but my father is a pastor. He's not here today because he's actually out spreading the word of God and not trying to eliminate rights for Americans that need, that need this credit. Um, so that being said, I also wish that there were a little bit more of the other stickers out in the lobby because I noticed, or in the audience, I noticed after they spoke, they left. I see a lot of yellow out here. So I don't want to preach to the crowd or preach to the choir, but uh, uh, Mr. Mullins had made a comment about how he doesn't like to hear from our point of view because we work for the company. Very few actual customers have been in here today disputing our product and services. I've seen a lot of groups coming in speaking on behalf of other people, but I've yet, I think I've seen two customers out of all of the speakers today. And everyone else is probably someone who has never had a payday loan. Thank you, Mr. Hampton. Now, Dale Irwin. Reverend C.L. Stancil. Oh, I'm sorry, Dale Irwin. I'm Dale Irwin. Uh, I'm not being paid to be here today. Uh, I was a, a, a lawyer for legal aid in the late 1970s when payday lending got its foothold in Kansas City, and it was illegal then, and they were exploiting a usury loophole called a brokerage fee. I have battled this industry my entire career. I've fought in the legislature. I've watched the lobbyists buy off legislators. Uh, I've uh, I know what happened when interest rates in Missouri went from 26.62% in uh, 1989 to 450% in 1990 when the payday lending loan sharking was legalized. And then I watched in 1998 when the usury cap, usury cap was completely ripped off. And now there is no amount of interest that is prohibited in Missouri. As a result, we have a case that came out of the St. Louis Court of Appeals last year, Hollins versus Loan Express Company, where a woman borrowed $80. They got a judgment against her for $2,000. They garnished her wages to the tune of 
$1,000, and the balance on her loan after that is $19,000. I have not heard anyone on that panel justify something like that. As a matter of fact, I didn't hear any of, I heard none of the industry representatives even mention the interest rates on these loans. Thank and you, Mr. Irwin. the traps that people are put into by this predatory situation. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Irwin. <laughs> Reverend C.L. Stansel. Hi, I'm Reverend C.L. Stansel. I'm here from St. Louis, Missouri. I represent Wayman AME Church, pastor of a major church in the city, and I heard one young man say, that his father was out preaching. I'm so glad I'm here to speak truth to power because that's my job. And, and we gotta be careful about the language that I'm hearing. The language that I'm hearing is the same language that I've heard before. When I listen to them talk and they talk about access, that the people need it, that the people have to have it, and then they also, we talk about the reincurring cycle. It's the same language that I hear from the drug dealers when I try to get them out of my community. And just like I try to get the drug dealers out of my community, I want the, the predatory lenders out of our communities as well because they're doing the very same thing. We need regulation, we need underwriting rules, and we need caps. Thank you so much. Thank you, Reverend Stansel. Rodney Bland. My name is Natasha Moss, and um, I just like to say that I live in the communities um, that we are discussing here today. Um, and as a consumer, I have used payday loans um, to help pay for my education. It's not possible for me to walk into any of the churches in my neighborhood uh, to get help to help pay for my education. Uh, the cost of tuition continues to rise. Um, and as it rises, um, I have to find ways to pay for my education. So as a consumer, this has been um, a tool that has been accessible to me, and it has been beneficial to me. I have been able to pay for tuition, to pay for books. Um, I take classes online at times. I'm charged extra at my uh, university to take classes online. Um, and this has been a tool that has been uh, beneficial to me. Thank you. And Rodney Bland? No, okay. Jamaica Collins. We'll call a group of five more and then come to Eva Schultz. The next five will be John Sharp, Alui Kitcher, Jerisha Kirkwood, Pat Dukovic, Pedro Zamora, Eva Schultz. John Sharp. A Louis Kitcher. Oh, thank you. Hi, my name is Larry Ginter. I'm a third generation family farmer from Rhodes, Iowa. I'm a member of Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement and National People's Action. I want to be clear, I did not get paid to be here. I came here to stand in solidarity. I came here to stand in solidarity with all those folks who are caught up in the never-ending down downward spiral of debt bondage to payday lenders. I came here to charge the CFPB to protect those folks who are caught up in the debt trap by ruthless payday lenders. <clears throat> Debt bondage has always been one of the crimes that has led and does lead to unrest and poverty all over the planet. Here in America, the crime of usury, usury makes me mad. We've seen way too many times the devastating effects of predatory payday lending in our communities and our families. It has to stop now, and you have the opportunity to do that. You CFPB need to issue strong and comprehensive rules with no loopholes to fix this injustice now. Thank you. Jerisha Kirkwood, Pat Dukovic, Pedro Zamora. Okay, the next group of five are Samuel Chu, Claudette Humphrey, 
Reverend Clinton, Dave Tripper, Steve Kellogg. Samuel Chu. Claudette Humphrey. Reverend Clinton. Dave Tripper. Strippy. <laughs> uh, let's take the hypothetical uh, person who uh, was talked about by one of the, the speakers, Lisa, who uh, was a single parent with a young girl child uh, and a victim of domestic abuse. Let's look at her situation. First of all, I'm going to recommend to that guy not to lend her to $2,000 if she lives in the state of Missouri, uh, and especially if she lives on the north side of Springfield, Missouri, because there's no way she's going to pay that back. Let's be generous and say that working two jobs, she might bring home $400 a week, and 10% of that, $40 she put away for this payday loan. There'd be 50 weeks if she didn't have any interest, and we all know how much an in interest she'd pay over that period of time. But let's think about the other things that she's going to have to deal with. She's going to have to deal with the fact that because she's working the two jobs, she doesn't qualify for Medicaid. So she's going to have to come up with some kind of health insurance, or she's going to be responsible for the health for, of her child. Think about food, clothing, shelter, etc. If anything goes wrong, like maybe uh, the t she has trouble with her car, think about the impact of that. Think about the kinds of things that a person deals with every day when you are poor and you can't afford to have 10% of your income to pay off a $2,000 predatory loan. The, we want fair and responsible lending. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll call the next five, and then we'll come back to Steve Kellogg. The next five are Julie Kakowski, Martha Huffman, Jason Adams, Chris Gilker, Sean Elahi. Uh, Steve Kellogg. My name is Steve Kellogg. I'm from Independence, Missouri. And from 2005 to 2012, I was the Central Mission Financial Officer for Community of Christ. We handled 30 congregations and about 10,000 members. We have a program we call Oblation, which assists people who have uh, unusual circumstances, job losses, illness, accidents, to help them get through the crisis so they can be restored to financial stability. We don't provide any support for loans. We pay for utilities, clothing, shelter, uh, basic transportation. In order to help people, we encourage stewardship, we encourage people to be responsible in their borrowing. The one time I broke that rule was when we had a gentleman who'd taken out a title loan on his car, and when I found out what the interest rate was and how much he was paying, and the fact that he was unemployed and was going to lose his transportation and his ability to search for a job, I went ahead and paid the payday loan. We have people who get trapped because of the way these rules are structured. And so for me personally, the question comes down to, if I were a person and somebody in my family, or if one of these panelists and somebody in their family needed a loan, would they encourage them to get a payday loan? Or would they say, no, there's a better way in order to make your life stable? Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Kellogg. <laughs> Julie Kaikowski. Hello. I'm here representing the single mothers I work with in Omaha, Nebraska. We had focus groups around, financial, around payday lenders. This is what they told me to tell you that they need. They need affordable, monthly payments. They cannot bar pay you back $500 after they borrowed it two weeks ago. They need longer repayment periods. They want you to limit the percentage rate. Right now in Nebraska, it's 460%. Maybe 3% of the people who borrow at 460% can pay you back in two weeks, but then the other 97% cannot. They want you to eliminate loan flipping. Um, I do know Robin. Robin told me to tell you, as a customer of payday loans, here is an example, 960% daily APR, seven-day term, $75 origination fee. No one can pay that back. So I urge you to look at maybe Colorado. I know we've got to have a pro product that cash flows, but there's got to be a balance between dignity and cash flow. Profits should not take precedence over poor people. Thank you. Martha Huffman. 
Jason Adams, Chris Gilker, oh, Jason Adams. Uh, CFPB, we would like you to really take a look at this proposed rule. Uh, from the panel today and several people, one and a half percent of people have filed complaints. I believe that was your statistic. Uh, these are products that help and benefit people. And one of the things that I'm not hearing today is a differentiation. There are responsible lenders out there. There are people treating people fairly. There are products that are beneficial to the consumer. We need to make a differentiation between those of us running an ethical business and the ones that you guys are labeling broadly predatory. Your sweeping regulation cannot go. It'll put too many good Americans out of work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Chris Gilker. I want to share my experience, I want to share my experience from my family and people I know at my church who have used small dollar loans and it helped them out. Uh, they're all, not all negative experiences as we're seeming to hear. If they didn't have access to that small dollar amount of loans, I don't know where they would have gone. Look, these people can budget, they can make their own decisions, and they use this product responsibly. I look a little bit at the CFPB rule, and it doesn't seem to have real world economics to it. It sounds a little like the, the uh, credit union product that was out there. The consumers didn't want it, and the lenders can't make any money on it. So it doesn't look like these rules will solve any needs. It sounds like there's some rate controls, some price controls, and a whole bunch of regulation. That's not going to create any additional access. It's not going to replace any credit to any markets that you're trying to serve. Thank you, Mr. Gilker. The Please go ahead. Uh, my name is Mary Hussman. I'm from Columbia, Missouri. I want to tell you a little bit about my experience about why maybe you're not getting complaints. First of all, people don't know where to file a complaint. Are you supposed to file it? Are you supposed to file it where you got the loan? Are you supposed to file it with the state government? I mean, who do you file a complaint with about? Okay, part two. I went in with a, a friend of mine that he signed for somebody else. He didn't know what he was doing because he just didn't understand it. But he signed for somebody else. The other guy got the $200. They went after this young man. He wanted me to go in and help him straighten it out because he didn't know anything about it. He didn't get any money. So I went in. I started doing the complaint. I said, he didn't know what he was signing, this and that and the other. Turn around. Here's the police. They said, you're, you're interfering with business here. I said, I'm interfering with business. I'm putting in a complaint. They said, no, you're interfering with business. You're leaving or you're going to get arrested. And I said to her, I said, you called the police on us, on me and my friend? She said, I sure did. You're interfering with business. Well, how are you going to get complaints with uh, something like that happening? Thank you. And uh, th th that may be uh, present an opportunity for me to announce the CFPB does have a complaint system. Uh, the, on our website, you can file a complaint at consumerfinance.gov. And the telephone number, which is staffed in nearly 180 languages, is 855-411-CFPB. Um, the next five will be Jamie Turn, Reverend Dr. Jim Hill, Danny Chisholm, Reverend Rodney Williams, and Rabbi Doug Alpert. And I think Sean Elahi had a, an opportunity, am I correct? Okay. And Shelley, okay. Hi, I'm Elliot Clark. I want to thank Director Cardray. We met before in D.C. I appreciate you coming to Kansas City. It made my day. Thank you, Chris, as well. Uh, Y'all know my story, but uh, they're talking about how people are taking these money and goofing it off or whatever. Well, I didn't. My wife fell and broke her ankle. I fell on hard times. I was struggling, doing the best I can. I got $25,000 medical bills. I've got lights, gas, water to pay two girls in college, my other daughters are trying to have babies. I'm doing the best I can with what I have, the good Lord gave me. They say, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Well, that's what I'm doing. I'm also a United States Marine, so you know I don't give up. I'm gonna keep right on fighting. So now they're telling me that, oh, okay, well, they're gonna put us out of business if we don't have, uh, get this, the right rules. They want us to ease up on the rules that you're trying to bring forth. Well, hey, what about people like myself? 
we're struggling, we're fighting, we're trying to do the best we possibly can, but just because you got a job for the payday loan company does not mean that you go by the same rules that they do. They make their rules, all they do is hire you to enforce them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark, and thank you for sharing your story. Uh, Jamie Turn. Reverend Dr. Jim Hill. Danny Chisholm. Good afternoon, my name is Danny Chisholm. I'm pastor of University Heights Baptist Church in Springfield. And uh, recently our church entered into a partnership with a credit union near our building and we have been able to assist and help persons who have been trapped in payday and title loans. And while this has been very rewarding uh, for us and for me personally, it's also reinforced uh, the idea that much more needs to be done in terms of regulating this industry. And I wanted to tell you what really has me invested emotionally and otherwise uh, in this issue. First of all, are the stories. Are the stories of the people who are really ashamed in some ways and embarrassed to talk about the fact that they've gone to these companies and gotten a loan and then two weeks later and two weeks later and so on and they have fallen into a, a cycle that they can't get out of. And so we have been doing our best to assist them. But the other uh, thing that's got me invested is when I actually saw a loan application for $650 and the, the interest rate was 450 percent. And I realized this is beyond the purview of the Bureau, but it made me ask uh, the question, how can this be right uh, to do this to other people? I can't think of a scenario when this amount uh, would be justified. And, and so I simply rise to commend the Bureau for uh, taking these steps and any additional regulations you might have would be appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Chisholm. <laughs> Reverend Rodney Williams. Oh, good afternoon. My name is Reverend Rodney Williams. I'm the pastor of the Swope Park Way United Christian Church here in Kansas City, president of the Missouri Faith Voices and board member of Moore Square. The reason that I have so much concern is that several members of the church in which I pastor have come to me in confidence and shared with me their situations with payday lending. They felt shame, they felt abused, and they could not find any way out of this debt cycle. And so what I'm hoping for today is that the Bureau's uh, proposals will go forth and will help us enter into what I believe is called the emancipation from poverty. That we need to be emancipated from poverty and the uh, predatory lending tools that payday loans are, are tools to help to create oppression rather than tools to create opportunity. I think that the banking industry, the payday loan industry, which I do believe have some type of connection, should be tools of opportunity where people can live the American dream. God bless you. Thank you, Reverend Williams. In a moment, we'll come to Rabbi Doug Alpert. Uh, the next five will be Susan Schmaltzbauer, Jennifer Trogdon, Tom Faulkner, Colleen Simon, and Marla Morantz. Rabbi Alpert. Good afternoon, I'm Rabbi Doug Alpert with Congregation Kol Ami here in Kansas City. I'm on the board of Missouri Faith Voices, Faith Co-Chair of Missouri Jobs with Justice and Clergy Caucus, Metropolitan Organization for Racial and Economic Equity. I stand with the many, many people of compassion who are tired of seeing lives destroyed and our communities destroyed through predatory lending. I can tell you that compassion is not the lobbyists who descend on our state capital every year from the payday lending industry. It's not the obscene campaign contributions that go to Missouri legislatures to keep decent and reasonable regulations from being enacted here in Missouri. And it is not greed and self-interest disguised as compassion and concern for the borrowers. I'm here to say thank you to CFPB for, CFPB for your compassion, and I would ask you simply to follow your own meticulous research in enacting the strongest rules without loopholes to protect borrowers coming down the road from here. And finally, I would say if your business model is based on charging triple digit inflation, excuse me, triple digit percentage rates or interest rates, then maybe you shouldn't be in business. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Alpert. Susan Schmaltzbauer. Hi, I'm Susan Schmaltzbauer from Faith Voices of Southwest of Missouri. And we are a group of clergy and lay leaders who are, in, who are concerned about our, our community in Springfield. 
And what we see is we see that payday harms us all. With the, with the 450 percent interest rate, it not only destroys the borrowers, but also our whole community. We see this in the Department of, of Urban Development, um, Housing and Urban Development's designation of Springfield as a severely distressed city. The Impacting Poverty Commission reports has flagged predatory lending as a symptom of poverty in our city. We have seen it in the human toll on our neighbors. Kathy needed gas money to travel from Springfield to St. Louis for heart life-saving heart surgery. She took out a $100 payday loan to fill up her gas tank. To pay back her, that loan, she paid $30 twice a month for more than two years. Ultimately, she paid $1,500 for a tank of gas to save her life. A young professional was strapped with student loans debt and a car repair bill, a broken alternator. He took out a payday loan and spiraled into what he tearfully told me. He described this as the worst six months of his life. Thank you, Ms. Schmaltzbauer. <laughs> Jennifer Trogdon. My name is Jennifer Trogdon, and I'm from Springfield, Missouri. I'm a mother of five with four, four of them with special needs. My husband, he makes barely over minimum wage, and I'm disabled with heart, lung, and arthritis problems. An auto emergency caused us to take out a $400 payday loan, and that turned over to be over $3,000 over a four-year period. We had to take out a $500 title loan um, to help with daily needs, gas, utilities, and had to keep paying on that. Um, t total, it ended up being over $6,000 for both loans. Um, recently, we were able to help, we got help with the payday loan through a local church with the Credit Union University Heights. Um, and we just recently paid off our title loan, and we are currently payday and title loan free. Thank you, Ms. Trogdon, and thank you for sharing your story. Tom Faulkner. Colleen Simon. I speak today uh, for Bishop Roger Gustafson of the Central States Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, who thanks the CFPB for considering changes in the rules that govern short-term consumer lenders. The human devastation created by predatory lenders in Missouri and Kansas is unmistakable, and substantial revision in the laws governing them regarding payday installment and car title loans is essential. I'm writing because we believe God is at work in economic life, and therefore how we manage that life is a deeply theological issue. In the statement, sufficient, sustainable livelihood for all, our denomination affirms that economic life is intended to be a means through which God's purposes for humankind and creation are to be served. When this does not occur, as a church, we cannot remain silent. God stands in judgment of those in authority who fall short of their responsibility. God is moved with compassion to deliver the impoverished from all that oppresses them. As Lutherans, we believe the purpose of government is to oversee and promote the common good. In considering these rule changes, you have an opportunity to make our communities safer for their most vulnerable members. Thank Therefore, you, Ms. Simon. I, I, thank you very much for your reasonable uh, limits. Thank you. Uh, we will come to Marla Morantz. The, the, group of, the next group of five will be Pastor Wes Helm, Gordon Martinez, John Miller, David Gerth, and Dr. Rex Archer. Marla Morantz. Hello, my name is Marla Morantz. I'm from Springfield, Missouri, and I'm with Faith Voices of Southwest Missouri and Temple Israel Sisterhood. Springfield, Missouri has the most rapidly increasing poverty in the state. 
with a greater percentage of people living in poverty than in St. Louis or Kansas City. In Greene County, one out of four of our families are living at or below the poverty level. Low unemployment and high poverty is due to our low wages, even when adjusted for a lower cost of living. As poverty increased, so did predatory lending. We have over 70 payday and title loan companies in our town. I worked on the petition drive in 2012, and the payday loan industry hired thugs to stop the petitioning in Springfield. They, I was followed, shoved, grabbed, surrounded, threatened. My child was threatened. I was assaulted twice. They broke into our notary's car and stole our petitions. They bragged about spending this million dollars, and there's nothing to lead us to think that they treat their clients any differently. I want strong language and definition of terms from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. For example, a title loan company in Springfield routinely gets people to agree to waive the state-mandated seven-day grace period before their car is repossessed for non-payment. For a lower rate, they agree to have their car towed to the office after two days. Well, their car is towed to an office, all right, in a different county, and they are assessed an additional $800 fee, and I was told this story by a man who worked there. Thank you, Ms. Morantz. Mm -hmm. Pastor Wes Helm. All right. My name is Wes Helm. I'm here with Spring Creek Church in Faith in Texas. <clears throat> Dozens of families in my church have lost thousands of dollars, their vehicles, their homes, and worst of all, their dignity to payday lenders. My church sent me across the country to tell you our stories and to tell you that we believe more is at stake than just our assets. Our moral center is at stake. The industry says that because the market will allow it, it is just to charge obscene interest rates that violate our scriptures and our ethics. We say that the market cannot dictate our morals. All people should have their dignity respected. Please know that in making the strongest rules possible against debt traps, you are saying that we, as Americans, choose to be a just society. That our regard for human life and dignity runs deeper than our avarice. That is a stand worth making. Thank you, Pastor Helm. Know that we are praying for you and that we stand behind you. Hard days are to come. Be brave. We believe in you. Thank you. Gordon Martinez. My name is Gordon Martinez. I live in Dallas, Texas. I'm a member of the Spring Creek Community Church in Garland and Secretary of Faith in Texas. I am a borrower, an actual one in the building, number three or four or five or thousands of us out there. But eight years ago, I took out a series of payday loans because I was in career transition, couldn't make ends meet, and faced eviction. In the end, I lost my home, ultimately my marriage, and all of my possessions were contained in two plastic tubs. I would encourage you to have the strongest possible rules to prevent my story from happening again going forward. The debt trap is real. I lived it. Strong rules can stop it. Strong rules can offer both fairness and access. And I encourage you to make a stand for people above profits. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. And thank you for sharing your story. John Miller. Good afternoon. My name's John Miller. I'm an attorney here in Kansas City, and I'm a member of Platte Woods United Methodist Church. I'd like to introduce you today to a friend of mine, you see, I'd like to do that, but I can't, because my friend tragically took his life several years ago when he found himself in the payday debt trap and he saw no way out. This immoral and unjust industry doesn't just take people's money. It robs people of their dignity, and in too many cases destroys their lives and the lives of their loved ones. Many of our elected officials, including my Missouri legislators, are all too willing to gorge themselves at the money trough provided by predatory lenders. I commend you, Director Cordray, for conducting an open rulemaking process and for protecting the rights of our most vulnerable citizens. Strong rules help all of us, 
and that includes rules without loopholes and without exemptions. Those rules will come too late to help my friend, but they can prevent others from experiencing the depths of despair at the bottom of the debt trap. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller, and, and we're sorry for your loss. Uh, David Girth. Good afternoon. My name is Reverend David Girth. I'm the director of Metropolitan Congregations United in St. Louis and a minister of the United Church of Christ. A few years ago, I was happily oblivious to what payday lenders were doing, and then I went to a workshop and found out what's actually going on in our state. And I found out the, the high rates of interest, and I thought to myself, my goodness, what a wonderful issue for our legislature to take up. And then I found out that they had been bought out by the industry. And so we hit the street and we gathered signatures. And I thought, what a terrible hard thing to do to collect signatures for this issue. And all we would do is say, did you know that the average interest rate is 450% in Missouri? And people would say, give me that pen. One of the pastors that I was inspired by and, and really shaped my career told me that and he did everything right in his life. He spoke multiple languages and was a faithful interpreter of scripture. But his son got caught in a paid eight uh, debt trap. And the family had to bail him out and paid three or four times the original amount. This, uh, this system uh, hurts not just one generation but multiple generations. And often up the chain, not down the chain. Uh, we're in a place where we are grateful, grateful for the leadership of the CFPB. It's long overdue in our country and our state, and we need policies and procedures and rules that close the loopholes and protect our families. Thank you, Reverend Girth. Uh, we will come next to Dr. Rex Archer. The next five will be Dr. Vernon Howard, Reverend Stan Runnels, Brenda Brink, David Wilkison, and Craig Lloyd. Dr. Archer? Yes. Dr. Rex Archer, Director of Health here for Kansas City, Missouri, is a medical doctor, past president of the National Association of City and County Health Officials. I wanted to bring to bear the fact that for our half million residents here in Kansas City, Missouri, we have 10 folks on average that die every day. And I can tell you how many of those are because of smoking or blood pressure, but it would surprise you that three to four of those every day are from six social economic factors, and just have time to mention three, individual poverty, area poverty, if you live in an area, even if you're not in poverty, but others are, it impacts how long you live, and income inequality, which actually, the difference between that those that have more than they need and those that don't, is the best predictor of life expectancy in developed countries. So I really encourage you to move forward with everything you can in your toolkit to help us save lives here in Kansas City. The last thing I want to mention is that neuroscience tells us that when people are under stress and fear, they are not in their rational minds. And regardless of what the industry tells them, what they think they're signing, they don't really understand because emotionally they're in real pain. And Thank you, Dr. Archer. It takes these regulations. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Vernon Howard. Reverend Stan Runnels. Stan Runnels from here in Kansas City, St. Paul's Episcopal Church. The book of Proverbs tells us that the righteous will understand the plight of the poor. Others will simply never get it. We live with a moral imperative, a Christian moral imperative that we share with many other faith traditions to seek justice on behalf of all people, especially vulnerable people. That is why we are here today. I commend the CFPB for pursuing these regulations. We ask for fair and equitable regulations that protect consumers. But to pause for a moment, one of the panelists cited that over 50% of Americans do not have $500 or $500 to cover an emergency. And that's the reason we need this industry. What does that say about our country that 50% of us serve, or live in such economic injustice that we don't have $500 to cover 
an emergency if we need to. Economic justice is the underlying issue here. We commend to this board to use their resources and regulation to seek justice for all, which is a part of this United States. Thank you, Thank Reverend you. Runnels. Brenda Brink. I am Brenda Brink from Huxley, Iowa. I'm a member of Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement and National People's Action. Although I have nothing against earning an honest day's pay, I am not paid to be here. <laughs> by the predatory lending industry. I and nine others came from Iowa today because we are concerned about my friends and neighbors, our friends and neighbors who fall into the debt trap created by this unethical and immoral industry that thrives on double, triple digit interest and thrives on a business model that creates despair. I applaud the Consumer Protection Financial Protection Bureau for these logical rules, which are overdue and need to be implemented as soon as possible. Thank you, Ms. Brink. David Wilkison. Craig Lloyd. Hi, my name is Craig Lloyd. I'm with uh, Sunflower Community Action from Wichita, Kansas. First of all, I want to thank all of the religious leaders that are here. Usury has been a theological issue dating back to the Babylonian times. <laughs> now, I want to start off with a quote, and it goes, don't you know this business is a blessing to the poor? That was from Frank J. Mackey, who was the king of loan sharks in Chicago at the turn of the 20th century. <laughs> now, we're not saying that, uh, that there's not a need for emergency small dollar loans in this country, but that doesn't speak to the virtues of the payday lending industry, but to a deeper systemic issues of income inequality in this country. I sincerely, sincerely hope the CFPB's ruling will provide an incentive to actually do what's promised, and that's help the economically vulnerable and not trap them in a cycle of debt, which is the majority of the industry's business model. Thank you. Thank you. The next five will be Pat Turner, Judy Hadsall, Satomi Luster, Jude Hunts, and Ken Hutcherson. Pat Turner, Judy Hadsall, Shatomi Luster, Jude Hunts, Ken Hutcherson. The next five, Sharon Hanna, Sean Cummings, Father Rafael Garcia, Vern Tigis, Amy McClard. If we have any of those five, go ahead and just go to the microphone. Thanks. I'm Sean Cummings, and I'm here from Oklahoma City. Right. Um, I heard the panel talk about complaints earlier. And if things were going so well for the industry, uh, we all wouldn't be here today. Now, the uh, loan business, when clergy from 20 different areas can come and the one thing that they can agree on is that you're in the wrong, it's not a beauty pageant that they're here for today. It's not a popularity contest. This is an intervention. It's time to open up and look at your industry and see that there's something actually wrong. No one's asking you to close your business up permanently. They're asking you to be fair. There's a place for your industry. There's a place for small loans. People that work for me in Oklahoma City have taken out your loans and been taken advantage of by your loans. Like I said, this is an intervention. You either fix your business or it sounds like your business is getting ready to shut down. You've given us the option that your business is going to go criminal or you're going to have to leave it like it is. It's already criminal. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Vern Tigas. 
I'm a 21-year member of Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement. That also makes me a 21-year social justice fighter. And I have been, uh, have not been paid to be here. Mr. Cordroy, we have met before. Uh, when the CB, CFPB was first in existence, in the first few months, Elizabeth Warren and you invited about 30 social justice people of the uh, NPA into your office to present testimony about the effects of payday lending. Also possible solutions were presented. Some of those people are here today. Even though it has taken this long, the rules presented are a good start. But there are still items to be addressed, such as investigation into the sources of funding for payday lending, dare I say, big banks. I wanted to ask a quick question of Mr. Anderson of QC Holdings. I wanted to ask, how much does your entity pay to lobbyists for a living wage? And would you support $15 minimum wage? What would be the effect on your entity? Mr. Cordroy, now as then, we have your back. Thank you, Mr. Tingis. Uh, the gr next group of five will be Michelle Scott Huffman, Janessa Perry, May Graham, Warren Daniel, and Cindy Becker. Is it, did we have anyone from the prior group of five? Father Garcia, Sharon Hanna, Amy McClard. Okay. Uh, Michelle Scott Huffman. I'm Michelle Scott Huffman, pastor of Table of Grace Church in Jefferson City, Missouri, and president of Faith Voices for Jefferson City. People struggling with financial crises need education, empowerment, and living wage jobs, not predatory loans. I'd like to use Mr. Hempler's very touching example of Lisa and her five-year-old daughter. To get out of an abusive situation, Lisa doesn't need a loan that she can never repay. She needs a community of people who have her best interests at heart, not a for-profit company in an unrestricted aid industry that only cares about their, her when they're getting her money. That same compassionate, concerned installment lender will later harass her and extract money she doesn't have from her checking account until it's closed and then take further action to keep her living in poverty, afraid for herself and her five-year-old daughter. She simply traded one abuser for another. The threat that real industry regulation will result in consumers being hurt by the remaining illegal and un unregulated lenders as a Trojan horse and a desperate attempt by a predatory industry that doesn't want to release its death grip on our most vulnerable citizens. The CFPB has proven itself a strong and fair regulatory agency that cracks down on illegal lending and collection activity. We must enact strong rules now to do everything we can to stop the extraction of wealth from communities that already have none. Thank you, Ms. Scott Huffman. <laughs> Janessa Perry. How you doing? I would like to say thank you all first off, and I would also like to thank CCO Ms. Flemings. My name is Teresa Perry. I'm with NAACP. I think my family here has already spoken, but I would just like to leave you with some words. The light bill has went up. The water bill has went up. The gas bill has went up. You have different things that people are dealing with for us. They're getting ready to go up on babysitting fees, de uh, child development fees. When you have people say, be accountable, tell them to look into these families first. Look at the families. Every family is not alike. Everybody is not uh, born with money. Everybody is not, okay, well here, you have some people that are really trying to work and trying to make their families work. Then let's go on the other side of, then you have some banks that don't want a loan to you if you're of color. Let's be honest, we got some redlining going on. So if they gonna do it, tell them to tell the truth. So I pray you look at everybody and try to help because we just keep fighting, fighting fighting. It's just all the time. Gentrification at its best. Tell them to quit raping. This is a system that just keep raping and raping and raping. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. Perry. <laughs> May Graham. Warren Daniel. My name is Warren Daniel. I'm the Compliance Director for Gulfport Financial LLC. Since the creation of the CFPB, our company's compliance expenses have quadrupled 
and to be compliant with the new proposed rules, our expenses will again go up dramatically. Our company cannot afford the increase in expenses while at the same time losing revenue due to the restrictions you intend to place on our loan product. In reference to making sure customers can repay their loan, I've been in this business for over 20 years and we have always made sure our customers can repay their loan. We turn down nearly 40% of all applicants because of a lack of ability to repay. As part of our loan underwriting procedures, we look closely at the customer's income to debt ratio. Also, if a customer loses their job and income, we work with them by placing them in an extended payment plan, which provides repayment terms of up to four months with no additional costs. We have a bank loan. And when the new rules go into effect, we will not be able to pay this loan off. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, we'll, we'll invite Cindy Becker momentarily. The next group of five will be Justin Penn, Sarah Stannis, Terry Lawson, Nadine Stahlbaumer, and Catherine Hogman. Cindy Becker. Regional Director for Advance America, and um, I've been with the company almost 11 years. My company provides our customers a product that they can choose to assist when they have an unexpected expense. These customers are responsible and appreciate our services because they have no place else to go in their time of need. Thank you. Thank you. Justin Penn. Sarah Stennis, Terry Lawson, Nadine Stahlbomber, Catherine Hodgman. My name is Catherine Hogeman from Springfield, Missouri with Missouri Faith Voices. And I want to take the panelists from the payday lending at their word. And I, I believe their concern for the consumers and for their clients. So I guess I'm just confused as to why the industry doesn't voluntarily adopt some of the practices as capping the rate at 100%, much less 30, um, extending loan periods, et cetera. So, I guess I'm just confused as to why there's a protest against practices that they could voluntarily adopt to better serve their clients. Thank you, Ms. Hogeman. The next group includes Erica Bernal, Ben White, Chris Saduth, Aaron Burroughs, Stephen McBride, and Marla Kalian. We'll start with Erica Bernal. Hi, um, my name is Erica Bernal, I'm with eFinance. I first want to state that I, they didn't pay me to come here, I came here on an option, so just laying that out there. And to start, um, consumers need to be responsible borrowers they voluntarily took out this loan, and we as the provider upheld them, provider upheld our end in relaying them their information and their terms. Also, um, we do take into consideration customer income, how many loans they have, ha have out, excuse me, and how um, their current debt. However, it is unfair to expect us as the borrower to, um, I mean, I'm sorry, as a provider to budget the, every single customer's income, like their bills, et cetera. Also, may I add that this is not a trap. We offer hardships, payment arrangements, and customer does have the option to pay down or pay off at any time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bernal. Ben White. Chris Sadath. Hi, my name is Chris Sadath. Good afternoon. Um, I do not work for a predatory lender. I work for a credible on-loan, short-term loan provider. Um, we use this term very loosely, it seems, as well as saying that it's a trap and that we're offering loans that you can't pay off. 
just food for thought, I don't know what business owner out there wants to offer a product that they're not going to get paid for. That's absurd that that's the consensus. We are offering products that are reasonable. We do offer products hardship, or customers rather hardships if they get into a situation where they can't pay. Our goal is to provide a service, not to occur a debt. Every week we have a meeting about our default rate. So this idealism that's, that's in this room today that we're trying to get them in a debt that they can't pay is insane. Why would we want to increase our default? Um, one thing I would like to say is um, I love Kansas City. I'm from Kansas City. Well, Sedalia, as I yelled earlier, but I live in Kansas City. And I'm glad to see the outpouring of community providers, Habitat for Humanity, all the uh, churches and food banks, etc. Because if this ruling's passed as proposed, I have 120 people and their families that'll need all your support. Thank you, Mr. Sadaf. Aaron Burroughs. Hi, I'm Aaron Burroughs with God's Will in Action. We heard from a lender panelist about a hypothetical scenario concerning Lisa and her five-year-old daughter needing $2,000 to escape an abusive situation. Here in Kansas City, there are more than a few high-volume battered women's shelters. They are safe and secure on bus lines and allow an abused woman and her children protected housing, food, transit money, and most importantly, psychological counseling, education, and non-poverty wage job securement to start a safe and healthy new life. The lender says that under new regulations, he cannot lend to Lisa because he only knows her family. This is a non sequitur. Lisa and others like her don't need a temp loan, predatory or otherwise, that cannot be repaid. They need far more long-term help, available at a wraparound service, battered woman's shelter, not a short-term lender, and that is where any decent human being would refer them. Thank you, Ms. Burroughs. Stephen McBride. Yes, I'm Steve McBride, and I'm actually a customer and stuff. And I do have some problems. I do have to admit, Advance America and Quick Cash are two of the most responsible lenders. But like if we go here, for instance, I have to sign all this documentation. And then they say here, they can mark it to me for, or, uh, for me through their affiliates or through their non-affiliates, which is a defined as companies they don't own. And then with them, they have 40 different names here that they could go buy and stuff. The interest rate is 330.23%. I think 200% is too high. And you know, they could do better than that. And if you look at all the marketing and stuff, the fanciest card is from King of Cash here. And it says, money you want, money you need here. And we can do better than that. Why not offer IDAs and stuff? Then people like me would not have to do a solution like an OHDNR, which is how the hospital do not resuscitate order. Thank you. Think Thank about you, it, Thank you, Mr. McBride. Please. Maria Killian. Yes, I'm Maria Killian with the Society of St. Vincent de Paul, St. Louis area. I live in rural Missouri, Franklin County. I want you and all the people that work for the payday loan people to understand giving loans to developmentally disabled people who are not cognizant of the papers they sign is illegal in this country. I have had to go to those companies and explain to them to drop the charges immediately or I would have to take them to our lawyer. Because, and what was said to me was, well, we can't discriminate. Well, I'm sorry. If you can't understand that the people you're speaking to do not understand what you're saying, no matter how many pages you've got on there, some of our people are not developmentally disabled but cannot read in this state. I'm sorry, but you cannot have people signing papers that they don't understand. It's illegal, it's not a valid contract, and this must cease and desist. Thank you, Ms. The Ms. other Killian. thing. The next group includes Reverend Stevie Wakes, 
Antonio Williams, Molly Hemming, John Miller, Bill Anderson, and Karen Kaylee. We'll start with Reverend Stevie Wakes. Thank you, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, for your presence. Um, I am pastor of the Alabama Institutional Baptist Church here in Kansas City, but in, on the Kansas side, and I do, do know personally. Uh, so when you talk about payday, payday loan users, I have utilized a payday loan. I have gone to companies, as were mentioned before, I have borrowed uh, loans. Now, uh, my congregation is aware of what I've done, and I want the lenders to know what I've done. Uh, this uh, practice, like we said, yes, we need small dollar loans. Yes, there is a need for the product. However, the product that you provide provides too much exorbitant interest. We need a, a product that will protect us from usury of this sort, where it provides over 30% interest. This is stupid, 400 and something percent interest. Uh, I had to pay this loan back over, over months, and became, which became years. I, uh, I had to end up filing bankruptcy uh, for my home uh, and uh, because I could not pay the loan back because my job that I had cut my salary $10,000 because, because the bank failed that I worked for. And so the problem continued, and I could not afford to pay it back. We need a better product in our community. Many of my community members have Thank left you, as a result. Thank you so much. Antonio Williams. Molly Hemming. Excellent. My name is Molly Fleming with the PICO National Network, um, and I'm grateful to be here today. Um, I do work in communities that have been harmed by predatory payday loans, and I work with the clergy that serve those folks. And I carry the stories of those people on my back everywhere I go. My pope says that the rich who profit off the poor are bloodsuckers. And my catechism says that usury is a violation of the fifth commandment, thou shalt not kill, because it deprives the poor of life. And so bloodsuckers is right, it's our lifeblood that is getting drained from our communities, $26 million in Kansas City alone, every single year. And I beseech you all at the CFPB that you write the strongest rules possible, that you avoid loopholes, that there is strong underwriting, that ability to repay does not get confused with ability to collect. I am grateful for you being in my city. This is my blood and my bones here, but we need you to do everything you can to protect our people. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fleming. John Miller, Bill Anderson. Hi, I'm Bill Anderson from Wichita, Kansas, and I want to say what that lady just said. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm here with Sunflower Action Committee, uh, Sunflower Community Action, I'm sorry, and Occupy Wichita. Um, I got the press listening to defense of loans in excess of 400%. And I was reminded of a gangster, Arnold Rothstein, who uh, fixed the World Series. You've heard about uh, Chicago Black Sox. Well, he did that. He also loaned money. And you paid Arnold. You didn't not pay him. But occasionally, people would, would not pay him. And what he did was, he was a smart businessman, unlike some of the models I guess we've heard. Uh, because he would have a jubilee, which meant if you owed him money but couldn't pay, you didn't have that debt anymore. He wanted to continue the relationship he had with you. I hope that you, uh, first of all, I appreciate your fortitude and patience in listening to all this today. It, it's got to be in the a really a tough job. We appreciate that you took the time from the work that you do to be here with us today. I'm retired, thank God. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Anderson. <laughs> but um, I really urge you to use your authority to create rules that really, truly protect consumers. This, this is, 
predatory is even too weak a word for it. Thank you very much for your time. And there will be a, a, a an action at one of the payday uh, lenders, uh, I believe, after the meeting. Do we have Thank it? you, Mr. Anderson. Karen We will have that. Kaylee. So look, look for us. Thank you. Could you tell My us your name? My name is Kia Trotter, and I do appreciate the CFPB being here. One of the things that I want to say is that this industry has absolutely nothing to do with race or religion. It's about the consumer. If this is the Consumer Pro Financial Protection Bureau, we should have consumers speaking up. We have to be responsible. I am a consumer as well as an employee in this industry. And so I have a responsibility to one, understand whether or not I have the ability to repay. Also, I have a moral responsibility that if I sign on the dotted line, I am responsible. That's with a mortgage, that's with a car loan, that's with any type of credit that is given to me. And so I think before we make any decisions, we have to go into the community, speak with the consumers, not people that represent them, but people that are on both sides of the fence that have a need for the product and that have a distaste for the product. Thank you. My name is Karen Casey. And I'm from Wichita, Kansas. But people, you got to understand, <laughs> this is mafia. This is mafia, OK? This is exact. I'm not saying they are mafia, but I'm saying that it's run by the mafia. So first of all, you got to know who you're dealing with. Now, I don't know who your godfather is, but I know who my godfather is. And she said it has nothing to do with religion, but everything has something to do with God. Okay? So what is happening, you will have to pay for. You have a come to Jesus meeting, whether you believe it or not. It might not be today. It might not be tomorrow. But sooner or later, you're going to have to pay for this. So prayerfully, I'm praying that you hear the people and it not fall on deaf ears. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Casey. The next group includes Rosie Black, Craig Lloyd, Mary Ware, Matthew Corrington, Hugh Esprit. We'll start with Rosie Black. Craig Lloyd. Mary Ware. Hi there. I'm among what sounds like the majority here who didn't get paid to come. My friends and I came from Wichita with Sunflower Community Action to urge you to strengthen, not weaken, the rules. It's expensive to be poor. There does need to be a way for poor people to borrow small amounts in emergencies, but clearly we do need strong rules that take as good a care of the poor people as it does the corporations. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ware. Matthew Corrington. Hugh Esprit. Hi, th thanks. Uh, my name is uh, Hugh Esprit. I'm member of Iowa CCI. Uh, we have about 10 members down here. I just agree with everything that everybody on the, the right side of the issue has said so far. Payday is a toxic product. We got to put an end to it. We're counting on the CFPB to do something about it. One other issue for you, Director Cordray. You got to get on board with Fight for 15. We got to raise the wage and we got to do it across the country like Bernie Sanders says, everywhere, because that's part of it. You can use your bully pulpit to help raise that issue. We got to raise people's wages, cut back on income inequality, and we got to stop the debt trap. Now, raise the wage, stop the debt trap. Thank you, Mr. Esprit. The next group includes Sherry Hawk, Dr. Tyler Wilson, Lester Furstenberger, Jeff Munzinger, and Jennifer Boothroyd. Sherry Hawk, Dr. Tyler Wilson, 
Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to say I've heard a lot today about the annual percentage rates, the 400%. Um, I want to be clear on that. On a $100 loan, you're actually only getting charged $19, which isn't really that bad. I only hear about the 400%, and it's like, I want to make it clear, $19 on $100, that's less than 20% of what you're actually borrowing. Um, so whenever you take out that loan, you're only actually paying back $19 of that fee. We're lending you the 100 What about an NSF fee? No, there are no NSF fees. <laughs> um, another thing... <laughs> Another thing I wanted to bring up about this whole thing is uh, a lot of people were talking about debt traps and things like that, how they had to come in and get a payday loan, how they had to do that. No one's forcing you into the office to do that. You're, it's your free will. You're doing it yourself. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Lester Furstenberger. Good afternoon. My name is Lester Furstenberger. I'm an attorney, and I live in Philadelphia. I read quickly this morning all 1,334 pages of the proposed rule. I'll make more extended remarks in due course. However, I wanted to express one thing that jumped off the screens to me. Uh, specifically, it's what appears to be um, a false predicate that 36% is the appropriate rate for all payday borrowers. I assume the Bureau is very familiar with uh, the concepts and practices of risk-based pricing. Uh, the proposed rule appears to ignore this practice. Um, I'm not suggesting that I know what the appropriate rate is. I'm simply suggesting for the typical payday borrower, it is not 36%. For the record, I commend uh, for your consideration this simple math. A $500 payday loan at 36% for two weeks yields interest income to the lender of 50 cents a day. $7 for the total loan. I suggest that uh, you consider changing the rate, considering it a more appropriate rate, because no profitable business uh, could operate at those rates. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Furstenberger. <laughs> Jeff Munzinger. Hi, I'm Jeff Munzinger from Springfield, Missouri, where I'm a member of Faith Voices of Southwest Missouri. I want to tell a quick story about my wife's cousin. My wife's cousin is one of the lucky ones. She had a payday loan, and she had a cousin, who happens to be my wife, who bailed her out. Now, I'm not here to speak praise of my wife, but just to, to tell this story. My, my wife's cousin um, had a medical emergency and needed a $2,000 loan. The terms of her loan required her to turn over a check to the, to the company and required, uh, um, required her to pay $200 every two weeks. They withdrew that from her paycheck. She was about to get in trouble on that, and she came to my wife. She was emotional. She said, can you help me out? My wife agreed to help her out, and they agreed to a terms of a loan uh, with, a, with a moderate interest rate to my wife that allows her to go from paying $200 every two weeks to $60 every two weeks. So this can be done. We need, we, need to, we need to put a stop to these predatory practices. And for those of us here in Missouri, please talk to your legislators because we have no Really, we have no interest rate caps in Missouri. We do, but it's 1,900%. And, and our you, legislators need to be told. Thank you. Jennifer Boothroyd. The next group includes Chris Olson, Mary Kay Glunt, Dijuan Wash, Tanya Holmes, Stephen Reams, and Adam Rust. Chris Olson. Good afternoon. I don't work for a short-term lender, but I do work with some, and I'm um, speaking from that experience. Um, unlike somebody previously, I do see value in the other side of the argument. I have agreed with some of what you said. There are tragic stories. There are predatory lenders, but they are not all predatory. And with a rule like this that's very encompassing, it will put some good players out of business. And I appreciate consumer advocacy. I appreciate faith-based charities. They provide a great service. And I encourage everybody to continue doing that. But until you can expand that effort, there's still a massive credit gap that needs to be serviced. There are consumers that I've spoken with directly who would have lost a job without this product, who would have uh, experienced other crises without this type of loan product. 
The answer is not to obliterate it. The answer is to regulate it, sure, but in a responsible way that it still allows a company to make a profit because if they don't, they can't offer the product. So I would just simply suggest that we take a more calm approach, recognize that there are bad apples, but there are good apples, and do it responsibly so that businesses that offer service that is needed can survive until the rest of these uh, very vocal charity groups can actually step up and cover the gap for us. Thank Thanks. you, Mr. Olson. <laughs> Mary Kay Glunt. I wanted to speak to QC Holdings, um, but there, he's not here. But I wanted to tell you, I found this report. Oh, are you here? Good. I wanted to ask, I wanted to ask you about it. Um, through your website, I found on CFSA, the Community of Financial Services Association of America, the Harris Interactive Poll that touts how wonderful payday loans are, how excited and happy people are, 96%, and the cost, 92%. But then when you go down to the information about who you talk to, the little over 1,000 people that were talked to, the, the lists that were given to Harris Interactive to do this poll were people who paid off a payday loan within three months of the summer of 2013 and had been paid off for at least two weeks before they borrowed again. Hello. The people who were trapped in the program weren't asked. The people who couldn't find a way out weren't asked. So this was a skewed, and so CFPD, if you've looked at this survey, I want to let you know you need to look at who was talked to. Thank you, Ms. Glunt. <laughs> Jajuan Wash. Tanya Holmes. Stephen Reeves. Stephen Reeves with the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. Thank you, Director Cordray and CFPB staff. Across the country, people of faith have been working together for years to reform lending practices they see as immoral and predatory because of the impact they have witnessed firsthand. Churches and pastors and ministries have been granting benevolence funds, creating alternative lending models, and offering financial education classes. They've also shown up as advocates in city halls, state legislatures, and on Capitol Hill. They have come together across sincere differences to say enough. Enough preying on our desperate and vulnerable neighbors for profit. Enough capitalizing on the shame of being in need by exploiting those who seek to take responsibility for their problems. And enough selling a product that purports to be a way out of a bind, but for so many is instead a way into a trap. We don't tolerate selling defective products in this country. We recall millions of cars every year on the small probability that someone could get hurt. Debt trap loans are hurting our fellow Americans and it's time for a recall. Thank you, Mr. Reeves. Thank you. Adam Rust. Hi, my name is Adam Rust. I'm from Reinvestment Partners in Durham, North Carolina. So North Carolina, that's what's key about what I want to say, because we're a non-authorizing state. We haven't had payday lending since 2005. At RP, we see about 6,000 people a year. We help them uh, if they have a problem with their mortgage. Uh, we help them with free tax prep. And sometimes we help them to save money for a dream. Uh, what's clear is that they face difficult circumstances that don't change. A payday loan might provide relief, very short-term relief. It won't solve the fundamental problem at all. And for many of them, it'll put them in a much worse place. Uh, we know that most people who had these loans in North Carolina, they are glad they don't have access to them anymore. That's what surveys have clearly said again and again. Our message today is that we want a rule that will, that will make sure that North Carolina doesn't take a step backwards. It's a complicated moment because there are clearly people in Missouri who are hurting who need this help. In North Carolina, we've, through our own state effort, we've eliminated it. So we want a strong rule. When, that, when this rule is finally published, just having a rule isn't enough. It has to be a rule that really makes a difference. Thank you, Mr. Rust. The next group includes Melinda Robinson, Reverend Phil Snyder, Terrence Wisely, Reverend Wallace Sr., Reverend Wallace II, 
Reverend Brandon Mims. The next group includes Winifred Jamison, Kyla Baylock, Bridget Hughes, Leisha Manning, Reverend Tobias Schillensman, Reverend Susan McCann, Reverend Lloyd Fields, Reverend Stevie Wakes, Merle Zerke, Zeft Hunter, Larry Ginter, Tim Thomas, Miguel Rodriguez, Amy Jude Keaton, My name is Seth Hunter. I'm here uh, representing a local organization, Communities Creating Opportunity. We're here to really lift up the pain that families are feeling all across the region. Uh, we're not saying that payday loan uh, shops should not exist, but what we're saying is it's immoral and it is unjust to charge individuals 455% interest rates. Um, what, what happens to folks who get caught into this trap is that it affects their quality of life and both the length of life. And we are here to take a stand today and we're, we, we thank the uh, CFPB for showing up here in Kansas City and listening to the pain. And hopefully when you leave today, you're prepared to act on it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. <laughs> Dorothy Kaiser, Elizabeth Glenn, Larry Ginter, Steve Glorioso, Bishop James Tyndall, Reverend George Paul Wood, Andrew Zelay, Jennifer Trodgan, Tamalu Brothers, Jennifer Sims, Paul Kurtman, Deanna Beasley, Natter Moss, Rodney Bland, Jamaica Collins, Eva Schulte, John Sharp, Alu Kithcher, Jamaica Collins. Um, I'm with. Um, CCO and PICO and all of them. I want to say that we understand that um, payday loan lenders have to mitigate risk. It's risky to uh, lend to the poor. I get that. Um, we understand also that people want to keep their jobs. We don't want to put people out of business. That's not why we're here. What we want is fairness. We want to be lended to fairly. We want reasonable rates. We don't, want, we don't want to get rid of the product because we need it. We do, especially considering redlining and all of that. We need small dollar lending. We need it in our community, but we need it with fairness. That's what we're asking. We need it with regulation. We need it with stronger rules because the rules that are in place aren't helping. They're hurting. So I'm asking you on behalf of everyone in my community and my church, please, regulate strongly. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Collins. Hi, I'm Eva Schulte. I already spoke, but am here for Winifred, who um, was just called. This is her testimony. 12 years ago, my husband was deported, leaving me a single mother of three. Our home was foreclosed, my car repossessed, and eventually my student loans went into default. I was left with my husband's car we bought at an auction. At the time, I was an investigator for the state of Missouri Public Defender, and having a working vehicle was a condition of employment. My car broke down, needing $800 worth of repairs. I was faced with the decision to take out multiple payday loans to pay for the repairs or lose my job. Nine years later, I've paid the initial loans tenfold tenfold, yet because I eventually defaulted, I can no longer have a bank account, a normal bank account, or a credit union account. In a matter of 24 hours, my checking account went into the negative, over 
$1,000 was eventually closed by the bank and I never recovered. And just this day, as I was escorting these brave men and women into the building, I got a call from the credit agency holding one of my payday loan accounts nine years later. This one moment in my time still haunts my life. Thank you. Testimony from Winifred Jamison. Thank you. John Sharp, Alou Kethsher, Jerisha Kirkwood. Hi, I'm Jerisha Kirkwood, and I work for an honest company. We help people. I see a lot of organizations here today speaking on behalf of the community. Where were you at when the community needed the light bill paid? Where were you at when the community needed to provide their kids a Christmas? If you close our doors, it will be no more of that. These people will be sick and they will have nowhere to turn to. Thank you, Ms. Kirkwood. <laughs> Pat. Dujakovic, Pedro Zamora, Samuel Chu, Claudette Humphrey, Reverend Clinton, Martha Huffman, Jamie Turner, Reverend Dr. Jim Hill. Hi, and thank you for being here. I am Jamie Turner, uh, the heckler that's sitting right here. Thank you for being here, and I appreciate the regulations that you've installed. I wish we could get our legislation together so we can get our usury laws back where they were intact when I was a real estate agent. I want to say that, again, like my daughter Jamaica said, we need the product, and, and we are here so that we can get a decent product, a fair product. Stop gouging us with these interest rates. That's what hurts us. These overpriced interest rates are ridiculous. We, we can't live like this. Now, I have eight good credit cards in my wallet, MasterCard, Visa, and American Express, but they are already too high. I just had a sister killed by the Kansas Missouri Police Department. It was a tragic accident, but I needed $1,000 to bury her, to finish burying her. So I went to a title loan because I couldn't go to my bank. And my credit cards were over. We need better product. You're not giving us good product. These rules will help us, and I want them to be strong also. They will help us so we can get over the hump that our big time lenders don't want to deal with us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Turner. <laughs> Tom Faulkner, Dr. Vernon Howard, David Wilkinson, Judy Hadsall, Shitomi Luster, Jude Hunt, Ken Hutcherson, Sharon Hanna, Father Rafael Garcia, Amy McLard, May Granham, May Graham, Sarah Stance, Terry Lawson, Nadine Stahlbomber, Ben White, Antonio Williams, John Miller, Rosie Black, Craig Lloyd, Matthew Corrington, Sherry Hawk, Jennifer Boothroyd, Dijuan Wash, Tanya Holmes.
actually talk to Holmes. Uh, my name's Katie Stevenson. I work for Revival Management Company. Um, I've been in this industry for over 11 years, and I've seen the ups and downs, the ebbs and flows, and people get put out of business because they're not abiding by the regulations that already are in place. We have regulations that we have to abide by every single day that regulate what we can loan to, who we can loan to, what state we can loan to, all those good things. Also, people come to us because if you're negative in your bank account, you get a $34 charge every single time a transaction comes through. Our interest rates are lower than 30%, which saves you that $34 15 times over a weekend. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stevenson. At this time, I'd like to invite anyone that we may have missed. My name is Alice Kitchen. I am with Jobs is Justice, the Worker Rights Board. I'm here on behalf of a young woman who someone may have called a customer. I would call her a vulnerable person. I met her in graduate school. She was my student. She graduated with a master's degree. She can't be here today because she's working. She finally got a job that pays and she can't afford to take off. She left graduate school with $80,000 of debt, some student loan and much of it payday loan. She was the guardian of her grandfather. She had minimal um, ability to uh, pay any of her costs and she had no car, and she had a coffee shop job. So for our young people, the future, this is not a future. We can do better. We need you to have strong regulations that are enforced swiftly, and the consequences are proportional to the harm that is done. Thank you. My name is Carolyn Moore. I'm with Centronex. And I just, I decided that I did want to speak today because when you look at a payday loan, you're looking at it to get you to your payday. But for some reason, our consumer is using it as an income base. Instead of just having a job, they're using it as income now. And that's why we have this big situation where they're seeing it as a debt trap. They've trapped their self into this debt. Because a payday loan with me, if I were going to get a payday loan, it's because a bill is due on the 25th and I get paid on the 30th. And then on the 30th, I'm going to pay it back because it's a payday loan. It's not a source of income. Thank you. We have one final comment. My name is Jeannie Scalise. I'm a co-chair of the Eastern Jackson County Justice Coalition. And I would like to talk to you back in the corners over there. We are not trying to put a payday loan industry out of business. I do not want you to lose your job. I work for social justice. If anything, I want a better paying job for you. I want to see your wage increase. All we want is just but like uh, fairness, 455% paying it back a $500 loan is way too much. If you, I mean, if you didn't have that in your bank account and you're borrowing it, you're going to struggle to pay it back. 455% in the state of Missouri, they can charge as much as 1,950%. That is not fair. I wouldn't do that to you at all. I want you to have a job, and like I said, we don't want to put the industry out of business. Thank we you for your comments. Want fairness. Thank you. We have two more, and these will be the last two. Hi, my name is Courtney Angel, and I'm with this group back here in the corner, as some people so eloquently put. Um, again, it is a choice to be here. We we're technically paid, but we chose to be here instead of at work. Um, if we're sharing testimonials, I would just like to share um, one of a mother who called in last week, and she'd come home from her birthday dinner to find her home broken into. And the door was, was kicked in, and she feared for her and her daughter's safety, and the insurance check wouldn't come in for another two weeks. So 
I provided her with a $600 loan, which was at a 30% interest rate, not 455. I'd just like to point that out. And she was able to pay it back because I extended her due date another two weeks from the two week pay date. So she had a full month to receive that insurance check and pay the loan back and ensure safety for her and her daughter and peace of mind while they slept at night. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tamika Thurman, and I'm with also the group back here. Um, I'm speaking just from experience. I'm not speaking as an employee. I'm speaking as a consumer. I've been to many payday loans, and I've realized that their interest rate was high. But then again, it's my responsibility to say, mm, can I pay that? Nope, don't think so, so I'm not going to take the loan. But if I know that I can, and it's going to get me to my next payday, and I know that check will cover this loan, I'm going to take it out. So I say all this to say, you can't put rules and regulations on something that a consumer is willing to do. They are 18 and over, meaning they're grown. So they're reading, and then if they're not reading, they need to read of uh, the interest rate so they know what they're getting into. Because if not, they're going to be death trap. But I don't call it a death trap. I call it suicide trap because you're setting your own self up for failure. So. Thank you, Ms. Tamika. I want to thank everyone who took the time to provide thoughtful testimony today. I want to thank the audience, the panelists, all those watching via live stream at consumerfinance.gov. This concludes the CFPB's field hearing in Kansas City, Missouri. Have a great afternoon.